just trying to find the south. But if you're looking for the truth, I can find it out. This I can't go to space, so we hit the roof. Then it hit the roof, and it all came to light with 200 proofs. Now I'm just really sick of people lying to me. So when I tell the truth, don't come crying to me. Pick up the phone, get on the line with me. Line with me. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? And welcome everybody to Globebusters, Light, Gravity, Interferometry, and Big Cosmological Problems. I am your host, Bob Xanadude60, and we are back with another great show for you today. Got lots of things to talk about this week, um, even though we're going to try and keep the show a little bit shorter, uh, and I'm going to keep uh, trying to do that as we get further and further into summer, because um, I would like to have a little bit more of my Sundays available. I'm sure everybody else would too. But uh, we have uh, several things we're going to be talking about today, uh, including uh, uh, we're going to be giving you a slight demonstra a small demonstration of the KVH DSP 1760 uh, fiber optic gyro um, online and show you a little bit how it works. We're going to be talking about some gravity experiments that are being done uh, and also the nature of gravity itself. Um, we're going to be talking about what it is and stuff like that. So... Uh, before we get to that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce my co-host. Um, uh, first up, we have Jaron from Jaronism. How are you doing today, Jaron? Doing great, Bob. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, as always. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we're uh, we're doing this uh, kind of solo, at least for a while today, until John and Eero get here, because um, I'm not sure what they're, what John's doing. Well, John, I guess, was at work, right? And then Eero uh, was at the hospital. So um, they'll yeah, probably Eero's be here shortly. Yeah, I think Ira said he was heading over to his studio, so we should uh, see him shortly. Excellent. Beautiful. Okay, so if you just joined us from the Jaronism channel, uh, we were talking a little bit about the, the meetup yesterday in Sacramento, and uh, that sounds like that was a whole lot of fun. I wish I could have gone to that. But, uh, yeah, I know that uh, Effie Mishka was there. How many people were there? Did you say 50 to 70, something like that? Yeah, it must have been, um, you know, and people came and went. There was a lot of people that were there for maybe an hour or two and then left and then people that showed up at one or two o'clock and left. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the total was, but uh, I would say easily you know, 70 people um, if you include everybody and families. And yeah, a lot of fun. Everybody had a great time. There was little groups of, you know, five or six standing in circles and talking all over the place. And uh, it was great. That park, I've never been there before. It's a beautiful park. They have a rose garden there. Uh, really pretty, and then they just have geese everywhere, uh, which was interesting because that was the first time my dog had ever seen anything like that. So she was kind of uh, tripping out a little bit because <laughs> these geese are like 10 times as big as she is. Uh, so it was good. Um, it was a little hard seeing everybody smoking cigarettes, um, but uh, I got through it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if people know that, but uh, since February 28th, I have not had a cigarette, uh, which has been incredibly difficult. But uh, no, it gets easier with time, except for the one thing I've always been worried about is kind of that social dynamic, right? Um, it's kind of easy since my wife doesn't smoke anymore either. She quit months ago. Um, it's it's easy to do at home because there's just, you know, there's no really desire for me. It's not like a physical need that I need. But when you go out to an event like that where everybody's standing around having a great time uh, staring at some people having a cigarette, I would be lying if I told you it didn't look a little bit appetizing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine how that goes for sure. <laughs> Well, but uh, I feel much better. I feel good um, after quitting. So, no, it was great to see everybody, and everybody had a good time. And, uh, yeah, can't wait to do it again. I guess we did it. I was confused. I think if you remember, or well, maybe that was on Raw that we were talking about that. But everybody was confused when the last time we did that was, and it was exactly a year ago on the same date. So uh, it was May 4th of last year that we all went to the bar there in Sacramento, Alley Cats, I think it's called. So, no, it was a good time. I, everybody, I don't think anybody would say anything different. Uh, I mentioned over on the pre-show that uh, met a guy from, that's employed with NASA, so uh, he had to make sure he showed me his NASA ID badge so that uh, he'd be believable and, and you know talked a lot about the fact that uh, the NASA satellites are uh, contracted out to third parties. It's not even people at NASA that control them or know where they're at or uh, deal with their alignment or 
you know, which ones are where. He says that's all contracted out and just talked a lot about the compartmentalization of that department and of NASA in general and how easy it would be to deceive the world. So it was great all over the place. Yeah. Well, you know, they have to have compartmentalization because, um, you know, as we heard from Cindy, ah, I forgot Cindy's last name, but you, you know what I'm talking about, the yeah, ex-NASA Holland. employee. Holland, that's right. Um, you know, she was talking about it's a wonderful place to work and obviously they want to keep morale high because – Um, They certainly don't want any disgruntled employees going out and saying, yeah, well, you know, they're, they're so secretive about everything and yada, yada. They don't want anybody dissing them um, because they have to compartmentalize because of all of the deception that they're doing. It's as simple as that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand it. Yeah. And when you have that much money, you know, $56 million a day, it's just, I think it's quite easy and you just have people off in their own independent jobs and uh, everybody just goes to work and probably does their tasks and feels like it's a great place to work. And then I'm sure they have parties and, and activities and, and food and, you know, anything that you can do to boost morale so that uh, nobody's really complaining about working there and, and it's a happy place to work and everybody just goes and does their nine to five and, and takes off. So, you know, I think it's indicative. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you very much, Broderin, for the 100 uh, knock uh, donation, which I believe is like, around, what, $20, something like that. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for that. We certainly appreciate it. Yeah, so. I don't know. I don't know what uh, that is, but uh, thank you very much. No matter what it is, we appreciate it a lot. So thanks, guys. Yeah, I think it's Norwegian Krones or Kroger's or Kr- something like that. Uh, but that's what the NOK <laughs> stands for. But I, I had to look it up one time because I had no idea what an NOK was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is either. But uh, no, it was a great time. So I just want to thank everybody again if you uh, showed up for that and thank Effie Mishka for uh, putting that all together. It was a great time and it was awesome to have uh, Chris Van Mitri there. He flew out from uh, Colorado just for this. He said, yes, he said he was off from work or had some vacation time or something. So he flew out and had a great couple conversations with him and I'm going to definitely have him on my channel uh, in the coming weeks just to talk about um, you know what they do to get these uh, geodetic surveying results and how they go out and, and, and you know basically measure the plane you know as planar surveying and then they have to go back to their office and of course punch all these numbers into formulas and applications to get the globe number so it's completely and totally mathematically contrived yeah absolutely well, the cool thing about it is, uh, you know, we're we're doing the uh, force level experiment, uh, the 18th and 19th of May. And by the way, um, just so you know, um, I will obviously be out there with them. And I know FE Core is doing a live broadcast. I'm not sure who is broadcasting it, but I have a feeling that I might be the one doing that, uh, hosting it. Um, so you're going to be hosting the show in two weeks if we decide to have one. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for informing. I'll be ready to do that. No. So it sounds great. Yeah. Uh, Chris went into some of the details with me and explained to how it's uh, you know much more intricate and uh, further distance. How far did you guys do last time? And this time you guys are going to do two miles, right? Yeah. I, I don't think it was much over maybe between a half and three quarters of a mile. Um, it was just kind of down along a, uh, a park walkway that was next to like a little creek. Um, and this place is going to be completely different. In fact, this place isn't going to be very far from my house at all. Um, it's kind of in between my house and Denver international airport. Uh, it'll be on tower road, um, around 96th Avenue, I believe we'll release all the details, uh, you know, positively next week when we've got everything all, uh, cinched up, but, uh, yeah. And whether or not also we're going to be starting on Friday night, which, uh, which we may be, because I know there's going to be a lot of. Um, effort put into this. There's going to be several people there and a lot of work to do on it. A lot of redundancy, a lot of running back and forth and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And there's also a video for that, which I'll be showing here shortly. But, uh, uh, Chris Van Maitre made a step-by-step video of exactly what we're going to be doing. So, um, if you are a surveyor or, you know, one or somebody that is interested in following this topic, Um, You can certainly have them look that over, and we would be thrilled to have them join us out at the test site on the 18th. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, he explained it to me, and it sounds fantastic, so I can't wait to see that all. And uh, if you guys need any help, let me know. But, uh, yeah, he said it was going to be very labor-intensive and that they were going to have a lot of people out there and need a lot of help. And so there's some people from FE Core coming, right? Uh, Karen B is going to be there. Um, I don't know who else, but yeah, uh, I, I think Karen B is going to be there. Uh, uh, Mike uh, Cavanaugh was going to be there. In fact, he had even purchased a plane ticket. Fortunately, he he bought insurance on it um, because he has some um, uh, 
legal issues or something he's got to take care of in the Netherlands. So okay. he won't be there, but uh, I know that Rick Hummer is planning on being there. And also um, um, John, nah, I forgot his last name from now you see TV. Um, okay. I, I believe is also going to be there uh, amongst uh, a few other people. So um, yeah. And a lot of, of course, local Colorado natives are going to be there as well. So tons of people are going to be showing up. Very cool. Yeah. Can't wait to see the results. And, and that's also going to be, you guys are going to simulcast it, right? Or do something on zoom for members. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, John Pounders is his name, by the way, uh, from okay. now TV. but yeah. Um, and I saw that, uh, that's going to be a thing for the premium members. And so I'm not sure who's hosting it, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I was the one that's already been picked out for that, which is fine. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> All right. Well, good. I look forward to it. And yeah, the experiment sounded great. And you said that Chris has done a video on his channel that uh, explains it detailed. He has indeed. Um, okay. I haven't it, seen that yet. So I'll have to check that out because uh, I did hear him tell me in person yesterday, but uh I would love to watch. Oh yeah, great. No, I haven't. I haven't seen that at all. Okay, great. I would love to see that. Force the level script on Chris Van Mitri's channel. So everybody should check that out. I will definitely check it out after the show. Yep, for sure. And also, Effie Core did a promo video on it. Uh, minute thirty-four. I did 34. see that one. Yep. Yeah, I did see that one. That was great. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So we get getting all of our little promos and stuff out there, and uh, life is good. But yeah, uh, Chris Van Mitri channel, Force the Level Script. That would be it. All right. I just realized I've always spelled Chris Van Mitri's name wrong. So just realize that it's not M E T R E. It's M A. All right. Got it. Yeah. Check. M A. I know. <laughs> I always thought it was Van Mater, but then I heard him pronounce it Van Mater. So um, I got it right now, I think. <laughs> All right. I will too. So we, we're in check. All right. Cool. So in other news, um, I see that you managed to get yourself on uh, the. Uh, <laughs> the flatter charlatans list. Well, I guess we all did. Yes. Uh, once again <laughs> yeah, with the made. penguins this week with your uh, ISS solar transit. Of course, this was originally, this accusation came from your uh, moon footage, the, the moon transit right. of the ISS. And uh, for some reason, the penguins seem to think that uh, you faked that. <laughs> yeah. And, and somebody told me that that video is not up anymore. So I'll have to check that. I don't know if that's true, but I guess the video that I showed the thumbnail for, um, the one that you just had up on screen, the one that called us all charlatans. I guess that that video is not up anymore. So I don't know if that's a result of me putting out that video. I just heard about it yesterday at the at the meetup. Somebody said that that video is no longer working so or no longer up. So I don't know if they've uh, backtracked on that idea or if they still are accusing me of that. And uh, you'd be surprised. I've got quite a few Skype messages this week from people also saying the same thing that uh, – um, you know, that they think I'm up to something with this or why would I post this? And I guess people, like I said in the video, man, I just, um, I don't know if people are afraid of people that are being honest or, or what's the problem. And, and if they wanted me not to post this because I saw the ISS, I mean, that's not what I, I mean, Bob, you know me from day one. Uh, that's never been what I've been about. If I observe something or I see something, I'm going to show it. So, um, you know, this is just one of those things that uh, anybody can go do. And I tried to make that very clear in the video, tried to even show people how to do it themselves. This way there would be no accusations of at least me faking it. Um, but I would love to hear people's ideas of what it is that we're seeing in the sky. But as far as me faking it, no, anybody can go do this. So before you uh, dare say that, all I ask you to do is just, um, you know, follow the instructions towards the end of that video. Uh, they tell you how to go out and do it. And there is something that certainly crossing the sun and crossing the moon. And, you know, if you want to observe that yourself, I recommend that you start with a moon uh, transit simply because you don't need a solar filter. And I think solar filters are hard to come by. I'm not sure if they're very expensive, but uh, uh, I think they can be. I got my solar filter from Bob when we did our uh, exchange, the P900 for the P1000, so that I could convert mine to infrared. But, um, yeah, if you do a moon transit, um, it's pretty easy to do. I, I give instructions on how to do it and, and go out and observe it, and then you'll see it for yourself, and then you won't possibly say um, that something is faked. And as I've always said, I mean, I've, when people say, like I say, that you know, things in space are fake or that spacewalks are fake or that these guys in the ISS is fake, um, that's okay to proclaim because nobody can go out and double-check them. It's all NASA's word uh, against ours. And, of course, um, there is nobody to double-check that. There is no... Uh, secondary witnesses or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> as far as these things, you can just do it yourself. 
Yep, that's true. And uh, also shout out to Dave, Ga Dave Gafford for the 1999 Super Chat. Thank you very much for that, Dave. I appreciate it. And also we got another one from Hulk Smash for $10. And Hulk Smash says, I think the ISS is a holographic image. They move along the sky. I think the sky acts like a movie theater screen where they can put any image on it they want. Well, you know what, Hulk? Um, Might be true. I I, I agree with that. I really do. And I've said from day one, you know, as we've been talking about the chemtrails and the, the barium and aluminum um, and strontium, uh, of course, strontium is kind of a minor agree, uh, uh, ingredient, but the barium and aluminum, and I find it interesting, barium, by the way, the atomic symbol is BA, aluminum is AL, and you got ball when you put those together. Just, you know, something to think about. But anyway, um, the barium, aluminum, and strontium uh, conglomerate uh, was said back in the day when I was studying it that that would give a very nice holographic projection uh, background to keep all the aspects of the uh, object that's being projected um, in a nice, clear um, perspective right. for anybody that's looking at it. Well, and the ISS is their baby, man. I mean, that is their their go to excuse. That is their go to uh, proof. You know that everything that they say is true. Uh, so. They've been, you know, going with that one for 19 years. Uh, it's their, it's their baby. And I've pointed out that they've never had a 24/7 view from it. There's so many things wrong with it. And if people haven't heard, you know, my opinion on that, you can just watch the video. But I do think it's interesting if you haven't seen the the video that's out there now, where uh, there's a, a physicist that's talking about the moon being plasma. And yeah, I mean, when you start thinking about that, and you start thinking about plasma TVs and how they respond to electric fields. And how it's basically a, a plasma TV uses these little small cells that contain plasma, which is a gas, and then uh, they're able to project onto that TV. It really opens up the possibilities of uh, what we're seeing is just simply projected. So, yeah, you, you know the thing I find interesting about this is I'm looking at your footage here, uh, and I I thought this the same about the moon transits, both yours, Red Red X, anybody else that's actually done this, is when you look at this. The thing that really strikes me as odd about this is the sharpness, um, the clarity of the lines and the distinctions between the solar panels and the main fuselage of the ISS. Uh, and again, people, you have to remember, we're talking about something that is nearly 250 miles away and moving at 10 times the speed of a bullet, right? Now, it's one thing, you know, like I said, to to see a fleeting glimpse of something like that. Um, it, you know, and it's also something else that is miraculous, in my opinion, that we can even see an object that's slightly bigger than a 747 uh, at that particular distance, especially when the 747, when it gets up to five or six miles, um, it looks like it's about the same size, quite literally. But the right. thing that really puts it over the edge for me and, and that makes me know that this is absolutely impossible is, is when you consider that there are times... Um, you know, when you do the ISS tracker or you watch it, that it's visible for up to seven and even eight minutes, even though typically the time is, uh, you know, six minutes that this object is visible. And again, when you're traveling at five miles per second, right, 17,000 yeah. miles is five miles per second, and you can watch an object for six minutes, um, it has traveled literally the length of the entire United States. And that right there tells me that there is no flipping way that what we are seeing up there is the ISS. It's simply impossible. I've seen it for uh, 10 or 11 minutes, Bob. That, so, that, I mean, yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, right. And how yeah. is that possible at five miles right. a second? <laughs> no, it's not. You know, there's, there's, it's just so much wrong with it. And, and again, I tried to point out the fact that... Uh, you know, if anybody's ever just seen it, and I'm not talking about observing a transit, I'm just talking about when you go outside, and and that's pretty easy to do. You can actually go online and, and have a text message tell you when it's going to be passing over your head. But when we see it at night, it is by far the brightest thing in the sky, which is crazy because it's not even a light. It's just a reflection of the sun. But as it goes over your head, it's just the brightest thing in the sky. And if that's the size of a football uh, field and we're seeing it from the ground and in, in a black sky then i just can't imagine why from the iss if they've got cameras on this thing showing the earth why we've never seen any lights on earth i mean a football stadium is much more bright in my opinion it's got lights all over it city lights when you're talking about new york or san francisco or these places and we're not able to see anything and when i start looking at that i think it's simply because that would be very uh tough for them to simulate in real time so uh, when you're talking about clouds on a daylight Earth, uh, that's so easy. I mean, we, you've got Google Earth, which acts basically as the ground below. 
Uh, everybody's seen those satellite images. Uh, they call them satellite images, or you can click the, the word satellite in the Google Earth and, and get that kind of uh, view from either high-altitude planes or balloons or whatever you want to say. Um, I just think it would be incredibly easy. Uh, Eru's talked a lot about them uh, painting actual models of the Earth and, and you know flying cameras above that, and we've seen all the footage of what they did for the moon landing, which is you have this big giant screen and you've got this little track that the camera rides along on the side of it. Um, so yeah, all that stuff is just so indicative to me. And, you know, another thing I've seen this week that, uh, talks a lot about it is, you know, I saw blue origin, uh, did another couple tests where they launched something up, you know, 20 or 30 miles up and then it comes down and lands again. And just think of all these tests that they've done. Blue origin has done multiple, multiple tests of launching something up in the sky and having it land again on earth. And they've never put a person in it. Same thing with, uh, SpaceX never put a person in any of these crafts at all. And they've had so many things blow up, but we're supposed to believe that 50 years ago that they launched one of these things, not 20 miles in the sky, not 50 miles in the sky, but 250,000 miles into the sky. And it went with people in it and landed on a foreign body. They didn't do any practices. There was no no practices of landing this thing on the moon. They just launched people up there, and they even televised it for everybody. And I've talked about this before. It was in the newspaper of exactly what time everything would happen. They made sure people had to, the day off of work. They made sure children had the day off of school so that everybody would be watching. And when you think about that, there's just no possible. That's how you tell a story. It's no possible way that it's real that they wanted everybody at home sitting in front of their TVs when this thing crashed and everybody died that was on it. It's just simply not what they would do. So I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all part of the psychological program um, to embed these things in people's heads, either traumatically or, um, you know, mildly suggestively or whatever. But, you know, their arsenal of, of mind games is epic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. To say the least. They've got them all. That is for sure. But uh, yeah. And of course, you know, the, the hidden technology, like I said, about, you know, being able to project something like this, uh, you know, to me is nothing unusual at all. And in fact, you know, I think some of the UFO sightings that that a lot of people see, um, you know, like the one that the UFO that came down uh, and kind of hovered above the White House. Or was it the Pentagon? One of the two. Anyway, somewhere in Washington, D.C. Then they had one that came down over a temple in Israel um, and all these major, major places. And they look like they are some sort of real, you know, type of object. And then they just, of course, disappear. Now, they could be some sort of a physical object. That's entirely possible. But I tend to think that a lot of these are also uh, using a lot of this holographic um, technology. uh, The same thing that we're seeing with the ISS transits. But right. you know who knows. Yeah, people can look. People can look into NASA Bluebeam for that. For that, and all, all that goes into that. And a lot of people think that there's a coming um, alien deception. Um, and, and I mean, there's so many videos on that. Russian vids done a, a bunch of videos. When you listen to Reagan and Clinton, Obama, all of them talking about the way to bring everybody together would be uh, some sort of alien deception. And if you know anything about the One World Order and uh, their attempts at bringing everybody under one. Um, you know, guys, and and I think that it's uh, something we definitely need to look into, and it's definitely a possibility. So, yeah, well, it's it's kind of pre-programming uh, for something that's already happening. I think I think we're pretty much already under the one world order. You know, with the exception of a few rogue countries that uh, don't necessarily want to come under control of the uh, bankers, uh, the, right. the central bankers. Um, you know, they pretty much got it sewn up for the most part. I think. Yeah, and if you fight against it, then they go in and they uh, remove you from power uh, with with whatever it takes to get you out of that, and then they can just tell the media uh, whatever they want, and then people believe that we're in there doing humanitarian work or that we're in there trying to, uh, you know, move our democracies over there and and try and uh, you know do what's right for the people, and that's not at all true when you just ask the questions of the people that are actually being affected. Yep, absolutely true. So okay. Well, anyway, so yeah, it was an interesting video that you put out this week. I, I definitely enjoyed it, but uh, um, I agree with you. We may be seeing it, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's there. And even if it is there, um, I seriously doubt that it's manned. But you know, just the the claims that they make alone, uh, you know, and the fact that we can see it tells me that that is not real. There's no way it's real. It's either like a. Uh, 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 Oh, what's the spy plane? <laughs> the spy plane that's all dressed up, uh, you know, the, with the, the U-2 or no? U-2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, oh, okay. it's the U-2. Yeah. Because, um, you know, we've even seen shots of the U-2 dressed up with, you know, high intensity LEDs, you know, strapped to the bottom of it, of the wings. So it's entirely right. something that could be there. But 
whatever. We don't and, know for sure. And what's on the screen now is so clearly CGI. You know, if you just rewind it just uh, maybe 20 seconds or so, um, you know, this. I mean, that's, that, it's just so clearly CGI, and people cannot accept that. They, they accept it in movies. They accept it in X-Men. They accept it in these Marvel movies and, and every movie. And it, But when they see it put out by NASA, they default to the fact that it must be true. It must be scientific. And I just don't agree. I think that um, when you look at the footage that we get that they did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's so garbage. And that now that, yeah, CGI is caught up to um, reality. It's really hard to tell the difference. Um, but people just, you know, go to the fact that they think that this must be. I mean, look at that picture. I mean, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's it's so clearly not real. And yet uh, they're in all these galleries. If you just search, or, you know, views of Earth at, um, from space, uh, this is what you see. And I just tried to contrast it with this. This is just some footage from some TV show. And clearly this is CGI and everybody accepts that. Nobody thinks that this is a real camera traveling behind this plane. Uh, but when NASA shows it, for some reason, they just can't. Um, separate the two. They can't, you know, they, or they they try to separate the two. As well, one is clearly real, and the other one is clearly CGI. But uh, to me, it's all CGI. Or else, the footage like this. I mean, look back to the 80s or 90s. You'd never see anything close to this. It was just ridiculous. It's just simply CGI has now gotten to the point. Iru could make exactly what we're seeing here easily. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the thing I don't get is how in the world are they getting these you know, star rotations like this, you know, from a single point when they're rocketing around the earth once every 90 minutes. And yet these, these stars are perfectly circulated. There's no distortion to them whatsoever. Um, you know, that in and of itself should tell you that there's no way that this is even possible because you would no. be changing orientation all the way around the so-called globe. Yeah, there's so so much wrong with it. And then, you know, this view here that supposedly of the ISS, which is a very choppy, it looks like it's digitally rendered, it looks like it's CGI to me. But uh, if this was real, then we'd be able to see lights on the ground when this thing flew over San Francisco or flew over New York or China or uh, any of these highly lit cities or countries, uh, we would see it. And then I also showed this view here, which is uh, a lot of people didn't, I guess, understand why I put that in there, but it's because some people actually zoom in and think this is what they see. Now, I can't see that, and I have, you know, the P900, um, you know, zoomed in almost fully to see what's crossing, and all you get is that black um, kind of background there. So, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. I, the, the one thing I do want to try is uh, kind of like that one showed there with a uh, half full moon um, as a try and get a transit uh, like that where it passes in the dark area just like we just saw just to see if i can zoom in and actually get any kind of features on it because all i ever get of course in the solar or the lunar transit is that black um you know figure that just kind of moves across uh, i don't think it really looks like the iss um but again i, I want to see what other people um are showing but again I, to me it just i don't see anything close to that right i mean we saw when i zoomed in uh, there's nothing close to what other people say that they get um, but again, I've never seen uh, Red's rhetoric or anybody like that try and proclaim uh, that they're getting images like that. They just show exactly what I see. So I think that's all we can see. And then everything else beyond that um, is faked. So and until I see differently, and that's what I'm doing is observing for myself and trying to see if what we're told um, is true. And so again, uh, until I can see further details like that, uh, to me, I, I simply am not buying it. And I certainly don't think people launch in rockets there. And I certainly don't think that people are inside of it. Uh, I, as I pointed out in that video, I've never even seen an astronaut walk over to the window and show us the Earth at night. It's never, nope. I've never seen it. And, and that's crazy. It's been 19 years that this thing is going around the Earth, what, 19 times a day or 16 times a day? I forgot what it is. But uh, it's just ridiculous. It should be done. And I think this is the way that we can kind of learn which things are real and which things are fake um, is simply by asking questions about what we're seeing and why we don't see other things, why we don't see lights on the Earth. Uh, I've heard everything from, oh, it's focal length, oh, it's because of the shutter speed. And I'm like, no, this we're talking about video. And why is it that I can go outside with my cheap little iPhone camera, I can point it at the sky and see, easily see the ISS passing over, but with their much more sophisticated cameras, um, they're not seeing lights on the Earth. So to me, uh, I'm still not buying it. Yeah, absolutely. And also thanks for the super chat from Coco Weepa. Uh, it says, read Plato's message, the allegory of the cave. And of course, for those of you that don't know about the allegory of the cave, it has something to do with um, a, I guess, men that are chained uh, up and they are looking at a wall that shows nothing but the shadows 
uh, of people that are walking around behind them. So to them, that's their reality. Then one of them gets set free one day and um, goes out and sees the real world for what it is. And then he comes back and he tries to tell his his buddies that are in there, you know, still chained up and prisoners about the real world. Uh, but unfortunately to them, he just appears like just another shadow and everything else. So uh, obviously they simply cannot accept what he's saying, but that's the allegory of the cave that, that was uh, brought up by that particular person. So, right. Anyway, um, so getting back to, you know, what this looks like, I'm not sure if it looks more like a, a, a an empire like TIE fighter or if you've ever seen the, the Battlestar Galactica, you know, they have the, the, the Cylons fighters that looks kind of like that. And uh, it's a remarkable uh, similarity to say the least, but, you know, just this pre-programming for movies that's coming forward. And I guess that, you know, for whatever reason, even though it's associated with something that is clearly um, sci-fi, right? It, it tends to make a more impactful, um, psychological hit on people, I guess, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think that's the goal of it. And like I said, that's their baby, man. That's their go-to thing, uh, for proving that NASA is honest and that, uh, everything that they say is true. Um, so again, I, I got to look into it much more and I tried to contrast it again with, um, you know, as we just saw images and, and videos of different, um, people who have claimed to have gone to space because, you know, the big thing is, oh, 550 people, Jaron, have been to space, which is, you know, 0.000000005% of humanity uh, has ever been to space. And yet um, these guys can't get their story straight. And to me, if I'm going to buy what 500 people are saying about going to space, uh, then I would expect them to have the same story. And when, you, when it comes to stars in space, clearly they can't come to the same conclusion. I mean, you've got... Uh, you know, Neil Armstrong saying that in the uh, cislunar space, which is the 250,000 miles between Earth and the moon, he says nothing can be seen but the Earth and the sun. Um, and then you've got other people saying, oh, on the day side of Earth that we can see these stars and that they're brilliant. And then you've got Leroy Chow, who was also supposedly in space on a shuttle and did a spacewalk, who says, no, on the day side of, of Earth, uh, if you're in a a spacewalk or something, if you look out to space, it's completely black. It's the velvet a blackness, this deep blackness that you can't see anything. Uh, then you got Neil deGrasse saying, no, on the day side of Earth, you'd be able to see the stars and they'd be much more brilliant because you don't have the atmosphere washing it out with the sunlight. So it, and, and no matter who it is, everybody's got this different story and none of them match. So to me, uh, it's easy for me to just surmise from that that I don't think any of these guys have been up there. No, absolutely not. And not only that, we've seen from, you know, not only our own balloon, but uh, other people's balloons, that, you know, when the the balloon is not getting footage of the earth or the sun or the moon, the, the actual bodies that you can see, um, when it's pointed off into a uh, just a area of space that doesn't have those bodies in it, there's absolutely no stars whatsoever. And of course, you know, like we, we, the lame excuse is always, well, that's because the cameras are not able to compensate uh uh, the aperture setting, right. To be able to see that. Unfortunately, that may be true for NASA, but it certainly is not true for the cameras that are being sent up on these balloons. Um, I know for a fact that, right. uh, your, your GoPro and my GoPro, we both have the hero five, I believe, um, absolutely. will make those, those light adjustments automatically. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just automatic. It's, you know, like an autofocus. And I think one of the reasons they have this and what I think on the screen now that people see is basically an overlay. And one of the reasons they do that is so when the earth becomes dark and people can't see lights, it's very easy to say, oh, well, it's because this bright item here is uh, confusing the camera. But there's also the views that I showed of the earth below where there is nothing blocking it, that we never see lights. And uh, again, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yep. Yep. It's all a load. <laughs> but yep, anyway. I agree. And, you know, we did for, gosh, well over a year, we did the ISS viewing parties and, you know, kind of got, <laughs> it was fun, but we kind of got sick, sick of looking at stupid stuff like this. Um, right. you know, the earth always covered with clouds, usually, you know, especially when, you know, I would go out in the morning or you would go out there and it was absolutely a cloud free day and look on the ISS feed. And this is what we got, you know, it's just, right. it's ridiculous. So anyway, all right, well, enough about that. And of course, it, let's not forget about our other joke here, the Himawari, um, which is supposedly the, the other go-to um, feed um, that people like to quote as being a 24-hour feed of the earth, which is utterly oh, ridiculous. Boy. 
Um, and I, the, I encourage people, and if you look up at uh, Bob's uh, address bar there, you can actually type that in and go there yourself. But when you do, if you zoom in as much as possible, and I don't think it's worth doing on the show because usually secondhand, you might not see it. But when you do get really close, you can actually see the stitch lines. There's a purple stitch line. Uh, you'd have to go off to the right there, pull it a little bit so that you can uh, see like the edges. But uh, yeah, I, I think people need to do it themselves more than showing it secondhand because sometimes it doesn't come across. But if you do it yourself, like I said, the address is right up there in Bob's address bar. Go there, zoom in as fully as possible and go to like the edge like that. And you'll eventually see uh, some purple stitch lines that, uh, but yet people think this is a photograph that it's being taken from space and you know, as I've always said, even if you believe in the moon landings, you believe that uh, the last time a human being was able to take a photograph of the Earth uh, was 50 years ago. And even if you don't believe in the moon landings, like I don't, well, then you realize that no human has ever taken a photograph of the sphere Earth ever. And at that point, then if you don't call that into question, then I have major problems with that. Hey, Bob, I have to run to the restroom, but I'll be back in less than a minute. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so um, let me do a couple of things. So, guys, another thing, a couple, another few things that uh, we're going to be covering today, um, like I said earlier, is uh, uh, since the title of the show is Light, Gravity, Interferometry, and Big Cosmological Problems, I'll be talking about the um, the Scientific American article, uh, which is, like I said, it's priceless. It look, I, I couldn't have written it better myself. Um, but we're also going to be looking at um, Jay Tolan Media's new uh, gravity vector experiment that he did and explaining that a little bit. And I'm also going to be giving a very small demonstration of the KVH DSP 1760 fiber optic gyro, which of course um, is the gyro. I finally now actually have it in my possession. Um, I just got it uh, a couple of weeks ago, been playing around with it a little bit and uh, interesting piece of equipment. It really is. Um, but there's so much to know about it, um, you, you know, and how it works and everything. But uh, the bottom line is, is from everything that all the tests that we've been able to do, all the research that we have pulled up um, shows unequivocally that this gyro is not picking up earth rotation uh, so much so as it is picking up etheric or sky rotation. And we uh, will be talking about that also as well. And in addition to that, Rick, uh, Rick uh, Zimmerman, uh, Seventh Day True Seeker, has also come out with a video talking about this uh, particular piece of equipment and why, and showing some of the articles, the scholarly articles that absolutely support our position on on why this is not measuring Earth rotation and the history behind it. So we've gone into it much, much further than the trolls have, but the trolls will still want you to believe that I proved Earth rotation, which I'm Woo! still I'm still waiting for my my um, Nobel Prize for that. And of course, <laughs> germ proof curvature. <laughs> yes, Bob, we are the heroes of the globe, Earth believers. We are indeed. And speaking, they, they love their movies. <laughs> yeah, they do. And speaking of globe Earth believers that are. Wow. Uh, all I can say is Dunning-Kruger. He, he, this guy accuses us of having uh, Dunning-Kruger uh, syndrome, but it's so funny because he is so wrong in so many ways uh, that, of course, whenever... Is that a Feynman picture? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a picture of Richard Feynman with the, uh, with the uh, Hubble telescope picture behind behind him there on, oh on the it. right side yeah <laughs> yeah on the globe and oh man if this isn't uh forced down your throat propaganda i don't know what it is yeah Simon fanboy yeah exactly that's a good call <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um as you know typically happens i will get all of a sudden i'll wake up in the morning and i'll you know either check the comments or cami will or one of our other mods will or whatever but um, this particular week, uh, Simon Dan introduced a video on May 3rd, uh, a couple days ago. And of course, on the morning of May 3rd, I was absolutely inundated with little troll comments saying, ah, ha, 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 Simon Dan really ripped you guys a new one. Uh, you guys know what you're talking about, yada, yada, yada. And of course, all of them are very, very similar comments. Of course, uh, what would you expect from somebody that has 169,000 bought and Holy paid for smokes. subs? Right? Wow, and he st and he got that little metal plaque back there from YouTube, which I've I've never received that. I don't you know I don't even know. I think that's for a hundred thousand subs, which it I is. had months ago. But yeah, I don't get that. No, it's you don't just, get that. <laughs> no, it's for people who pay for their subs, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And and it's pretty conclusive that he did pay for his subs. I mean, lots of people have done exposés on it and everything. But this guy is a complete plant. 
Um, he, his subs are bought and paid for, uh, whenever he does anything, all the comments are, are brought in and they're really very non sequitur comments. Uh, they not, half of them don't even make sense. The other half of them are cut and paste. You'll see the exact same things on our comment section. Well, you would, if I didn't delete them all, because I do delete them all. Uh, and I laugh at every troll that leaves them uh, <laughs> when I do that. So, right. you know, they're yeah, just... Yeah. I wish I could tell people how little I care, but uh, I don't know if that's possible. But uh, yeah, I just don't care when people like this uh, go off. Because again, as I've said before, he can believe whatever in the world that he wants, if he wants to believe. Uh, and so this video is about the Israel moon landing? It is, he yes. Said it's, couldn't it's about- possibly be fake because they've got some data on a screen? All right. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Well, we'll 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 let him talk a little bit about it, and we'll we'll listen to it, and then I'm going to, and then the the piece de resistance is is he says there's this one point that's coming up where he says, oh, and you're going to see some amazing Dunning Kruger effect from these guys, and then he goes in and proceeds to totally stick his foot in his mouth, and he is dead wrong about it, and I'm going to prove it, and I have citations to prove it, um, that this guy, I mean, Simon Dan, he doesn't know the first thing about science, let alone the inverse square law, and believe it or not, the crack was about the inverse square law, but uh, so let's listen to what his uh, comments are about some of this, and I don't know how the audio is going to be, hopefully it's going to be hot enough. Uh, for everybody, I did reduce Jaren's and mine audio so that uh, hopefully it will equal, equalize out a little bit better. But let's listen to um, Simon Clown Man and uh, you know what he says about our commentary on Israel's moon landing. Here we go. Uh, I got kind of a, kind of wouldn't call it screwed, but uh, yeah, I saw that it was about to happen, and I said, "Man, should I go live to see this?" And sometimes I think it's better to wait until you see the outcome and then to construct a little video around it. But I was like, no, let's go live. I, I don't think they're going to land it, um, you know, or at least obviously, really. I mean, I know that it's going to be faked. Oh, yes, it's definitely going to be fake. Absolutely. Personal incredulity does not mean fake. So it was just a matter of how they were going to go about faking it. And then, uh, of course, I you know, start my video. And as soon as I do, uh, it crashes, supposedly. I of course, there's no camera footage of it, of course. And this is something to look at. Why go to all that trouble to come up with a fake lunar landing and then have it crash on the surface? There's literally no point in that. Actually, I think there's a what? huge point in that. <laughs> there's a huge point so that you can make that exact comment. That, that's the reason. I mean, this is what people don't understand. It's the same thing with when they talk about uh, Apollo 13. You know, why go through all that trouble to say that there's – so that you can use that as an excuse. So now you have an excuse for saying, well, why would they go through all that trouble just to have it crash? Well, now you can say that. If they that's didn't right. have that happen, then you wouldn't be able to say that. So it, that's, your, that's your reason. It introduces an element of drama into it, um, you know, much like Apollo 13. You know, people were complaining after Apollo 12 that, you know, these Apollo or uh, Apollo missions were now a- at the point where it was interfering with their reruns of I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were complaining. They didn't want anything to do with that, and they didn't want it to be on the screen because people love the drama. They, they love that. And then again, but like we said, Israel could have easily taken one for the team here so that now when we hear somebody else is going to the moon, it'll be that much more compelling. And if the United States uh, completes some sort of mission to the moon, then it will look that much more great on the United States. And again, all these countries are playing a game. And this has been known for a long time. Same thing with the Russia thing. Uh, I've talked about this many times. When you look at the story that is told for the Americans, they tell the story of, oh, we were the first one to go to the moon. We won the moon race. We won the space race and everything. And if people think that's the same story that's told the Russians, they're, they're terribly confused. The story told the Russians is, well, we were the first one to send an animal to space. We were the first one to send a person to space. We were the first one to do an orbit. And then the United States came along and they spent a bunch of money to go to the moon, which was completely useless. So people just get confused. They get locked into one uh, viewpoint of it. And again, uh, it's just... When you're in Israel, do you think that they're talking about, oh, this was a fail? This is No, they're going to talk about that, about this was a great triumph for them. And that's exactly what they talked about. They said, oh, look at how we've come so close. And then guess what? Now they're going to get more money to go back again. This, this is the whole point. So now you're going to have more taxpayer money funding their next mission, and it's going to be that much more uh, exciting for their people when they finally get, do it. It's, and it's just all faked. It's just all part of the game. Um it wouldn't work very well if you landed there again and you say, okay, now we need more money to go back to the moon. Well, who's going to give you money? You already did it once. So it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the element of drama is very, very important. Uh, you know, that was the whole reasons of uh, why the Challenger disaster, quote unquote, happened the way that it did is, you know, and they had everybody in schools watching and, the, you know, tugging on the heartstrings of Americans 
um, and saying, yeah, these, these brave, valiant uh, astronauts gave their life for this. And, you know, we need more money because it's, it's important that we carry on this research. And, you know, you've got the drama in it. You've got uh, life and death situations, um, you know, all the tricks that Hollywood uses. And of course, you know, you would think that if they wanted to kind of build up the drama, they would show a lot of the failures um, that happen in NASA, like the bajillion rockets that blew up on the launch pad or went up, you know, 100 feet and turned around and crashed and all this stuff. That's the kind of stuff that obviously they don't want to have a lot of publicity on um, because nobody's really dying. They're just seeing a failure. Um, but when you have a failure with people dying, that adds an entirely different uh, aspect to it. It adds the human element to it and it increases the drama and it, it engages the audience, which is exactly what NASA is aiming to do. That's exactly what Hollywood aims to do. So anyway, all right, so let's uh, continue on uh, now that Dan knows his answer, why they would do that and why it absolutely makes a point. Uh, let's listen to the rest of his silliness. No, none at all. And I mean, everything leading up to it was just an utter joke. Um, like this, for example, you know, we get these little animations um, and it gives you the thing that says, oh, telemetry, okay. And we get, you know, even more little <laughs> animations about the engines firing, you know, and which one's firing. And it's really a cool little nifty graphic, but it looks like it should be something that would be on Kerbal instead of an actual, you know, space agency. This space agency has an annual budget of $100 million and only 30 staff. Now that's bloody impressive if you ask me, considering that NASA has a budget, an annual budget of $21.5 billion and over 1,000 staff. Um, uh, what? Oh my goodness. <laughs> only, this is why I don't watch this stuff. I'll get pissed. <laughs> I know. He, this guy is so stupid and ignorant. It just blows me away. Only $100 million and only 30 staff. Really? So that, that either tells you how unbelievably wasteful NASA is Right. right. I was just going to say. <laughs> or I mean, something. It tells you how inept we are that, uh, you know, how many times does 100 million go into the 21 billion that, you know, that means it's two days worth of NASA's funding. So that's just ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. 100 million. Yeah, two days. And that, and he makes that point. He stresses that point. Well, I think Israel did a great job because, you know, they did it with two days of NASA's budget. It's like, well, that's not really, you know, saying much about NASA. Um, but again, yeah, only 30 people really to to do the rocket and all this stuff. Obviously, there's, there's no way. There's more than 30 people. There's more than 30 people in that room. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like, oh, what, yeah. are the rest subcontractors or what? 30 people? Oh, boy. Uh, is that full-time people? And then everybody else is a is a uh, contract laborer? I mean, give me a break. You know, 30 people, there's no way could possibly do that. Well, a million people couldn't possibly do it because it's not possible. But, you know, <laughs> to sit there and crow about there's only 30 people and look what a great job they did for 30 people is utterly ludicrous. So let's uh, continue on. I think so, yeah. <laughs> it looks just like, like Kerbal, except for I think Kerbal has more uh, details for you than this screen does. <laughs> Hold on a second. Just, just it's unbelievable. Real quick. And, of course, oh, I was just going to point out, I just looked up the Israel Space Agency. It says their budget is $48 million U.S. dollars a year. So that's less than one day of NASA's <laughs> NASA's budget. So oh, so Simon si Simon doesn't get his facts straight. Are, is oh, that what you're telling that. me? Imagine that. Yeah. Holy cow! That's what it says. It says budget 180 million U.S. 48 million. Uh, that's uh, hard to believe. Um, yeah, 48 million. And again, if they want more money, then you know, then would it be best for them to have this thing land, or would it be best for them to come so close and then say, oh, but just with a little bit more funding, we could have. Uh, we could have done this, you know, and and then they're going to get funding for the pro for the next year. Yeah, or or they could have they could have actually put that camera in video mode instead of just a single snapshot picture. Um, of course, you know those those Polaroid Instamatics they they don't do video, so I guess that's all the money they had for that. <laughs> anyway, let's continue on. As we expected, it is in absolute stark violation of uh, what was it Crow's uh, law of HD. There you go. <laughs> Which, uh, of course, states that anything that can be filmed in HD will be filmed in HD. Um, and, you know, with multiple different perspectives and aspects and stuff. But, I mean, instead, here's what we get, ladies and gentlemen. We get little funky animations that that really, frankly, suck, right? They're not even good animations. Um, they're just like little blinking lights. It's so pathetic, it is utterly laughable. I mean, what do you say about this? I find Bob's attitude here positively sickening. He slags off these animations to his heart's content without providing a shred of evidence to show that space doesn't exist. Hey. <laughs> Boy, geez. 
Bob, can you please prove something doesn't exist? I yes. need to know that unicorns don't exist. Provide me evidence today. Yes. Now. Which fallacy is that? You. Proving a negative? <laughs> oh, boy, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And, of course, the next thing he, he flashes to is is when I'm saying a 15-degree-per-hour rotation. Oh, thanks, Bob. You're, you, we know you proved the uh, rotation of the Earth. Uh, I mean, this they guy— They love their movies. I mean, to them, the, the universal logo at the beginning of movies must be proof of a sphere of Earth as well. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I, they, it's just you're believing in a movie that's put together uh, by the, you know, Karen and or what is her name? Caroline and, and, and Daniel Clark, who obviously uh, had an agenda. And I'm not saying whether or not they were paid to, to promote that agenda or whether or not it's their own agenda uh, or whether it's their own beliefs. But again, uh, anybody who believes a movie. And again, if this guy thought that I proved curve or if I or Bob proved uh, spin of the earth, then why wouldn't he talk to us about it? Why not say to me after that uh, experiment, hey, you just proved the curvature of the earth. He didn't say a word. Why? Because there was 25 other people there who all knew that nothing was proven. Nothing. We, we all walked away and said no, nothing was proven except for one person in his mind walk away from that and said, oh, I think something was proven. But he was afraid to tell any of us that. Just nonsense. It's a movie. Get over it. Yeah, it is. And, and the fact is, is even though it's been out for over a year now and we've and I released those uh, fiber optic gyro results a year and a half ago, at least um, he still hasn't quite caught up to date, you know, and understands that uh, somebody else did the experiments. I was reporting on it. I, I mean, this guy is just so far off on his facts. He has no facts. He has no research. Um, he has no idea what he's talking about. And that's why it is obvious that everything about this guy is bought and paid for uh, just pure and simple he's a propagandist and that's it so let's continue on listening to the rest of his nonsense before i blast him 15 degree per hour drift yes you've proved rotation bob i know i'm talking about space now you know israel yeah they're a small country they have big ambitions but um you know with the amount of money that goes into this you'd think that they would have been able to afford you know at least one hd camera of uh, that video Jeez. but but no but you've already seen there is a camera, unless, of course, you expect a secondary craft to film it. No, no, I don't expect a secondary craft to film it, Simon <laughs> Dan. What I expect is video. If they can, all they sent back was one single picture uh, on the descent down to the moon and one single picture um, from orbiting allegedly the backside of the moon. So we got for our hundred million dollars which is really only 50 million dollars um all we got was two pictures that's it we got no video whatsoever and you're asking me why i'm claiming that this is all fake because there's no Jesus. evidence that it's real they have provided right. absolutely nothing but two pictures that are categorically fake and we're going to go into that too in a minute but of course you know your own your own stupidity mr simon dan you don't even understand how the inverse square law of light works. Uh, Dan is going to tell us here in a little bit that the inverse square law doesn't work on reflections, right? Oh boy, really? Yeah, really, really. It's the same exact <laughs> thing. It's the same exact thing. Doesn't matter whether it's a source light or a reflection. Oh man, and, and just look into the price of any satellite launch. Look at the price that they charge, and it's more than the than the entire yearly budget for these people. And we're supposed to believe that they went out and headed towards the moon. Yeah, sure. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, let's listen to what else he says here. Yeah, and it just gets ridiculous when we start talking about what they can afford. I mean, clearly they can afford anything when you're talking about these these missions that are multi-million dollar, multi-hundred millions of dollar missions. Uh, the fact that we even have to ask, well, I wonder why they couldn't put a camera on there is indicative of, of exactly what this is. And then, you know, for this to be on the screen on the left here where we're watching this little CGI diagram, uh, if that was really showing us what was going on at the time, then I'm assuming we would be able to see it crash in that little depiction. But clearly that's not actual data driven <laughs> dear oh dear Jaron thinks that the animation is drawn in real time based on the data look space agencies aren't there to satisfy the whim of every bunch of flat earthers who can't see oh, past their here noses. we go and the people that go. worked on the Israeli lander certainly wouldn't have said oh should we send up a second aircraft with HD video just so that Bob and Jaron can see that the whole thing is real they operate on a budget that's the equivalent of two days worth of NASA's budget give them some slack you know the whole right. thing yeah. Let's give them some slack when it's really only apparently one day's uh, NASA's, NASA's budget, less than one day of NASA's how much budget. Would it cost, how much would it cost to have an HD video camera on the craft? How much would that cost, folks? Think for yourself. Uh, I mean, it, really, you could buy a GoPro camera, and I'm not saying that a GoPro would work in space. You're going to have to build some stuff around. You're going to have to make it space-ready, whatever. 
So if you're talking about a GoPro com camera that costs 500 bucks, okay, now you can say for $10,000, would they be able to put an HD camera on that craft? Easily. So they don't have 10,000 bucks? Yeah. Well, not only that, the cameras that they do use, um, because it, it's in the metadata, um, are typical consumer cameras. I mean, they're they're like high end consumer cameras, right. but they are consumer cameras, and they simply, you know, make them temperature proof, or I don't know what they do to make them space ready, right? But it's not even a special camera that they have to use. And the only difference between the stills and the video is the mode. And, you know, again, they want us to believe for whatever reason that they can't change that still mode to video mode, uh, even though this technology has been around for decades. Um, only NASA or, or Israel or China or whoever, the space agencies don't seem to be able to do any of this, which is amazing. So, okay, so let's continue forward thing was it was so perfectly scripted it fit right into a one hour time slot uh right. 51 minutes so they could put commercials in obviously i'm sure and they probably are um but yeah it was just so short and sweet and you know they had everything ready you know all of these stuff was um clearly scripted you know from the get-go notice how bob serves up the word salad in a really confident manner and then just follows it up by saying it's scripted no evidence no proof just says that it's all made up and right. Uh, I mean, just the whole layout in here, even what, you know, even when you look at what they're looking at, they're just looking at animations too in this control room, which is absolutely absurd. I mean, look at this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, not one picture from, from there is, you know, from the camera, except for this one up here in the upper right, which is so easy to fake. It's not even funny. I mean, first of all, the moon looks completely CGI there. I mean, that's not what the moon looks like, but. Well, you spend half your time explaining to your subscribers that the moon isn't even a physical body. So how can you stand there and say that that's not even what the moon looks like? <laughs> because we know what the moon looks like, Dan, and it isn't a bluish gray body. My God, just because spend, we're seeing... And I spend half the time, Bob, half the time telling my subscribers that the moon is is fake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has ever said the moon is fake. We're saying that it doesn't look like what the moon looks like because the moon is not gray or blue. It doesn't look anything like it. So again, here you have another non sequitur, Dan, um, that you have no idea what you're talking about. That isn't what we said or anything like that. It simply does not look like the moon. If you go back to this and you look at this thing, that is not what the moon looks like. Now, he's also going to make a comment here in a minute about, you know, well, we don't know what the f-stop is, the lighting, the aperture, anything like that. Well, actually, we do have a pretty good idea because if this is the the being lit by the sun, then so should the moon be and it should be bright, but it is not. It's very, very dark, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, let's continue on. He's going to say it again, but that's okay. Right there. I mean, that's not what the moon looks like, but well, you spend half your time explaining to your subscribers that the moon isn't even a physical body. So how can you stand there and say that that's not even what the moon looks like? Utter drivel. Uh, you know, if you, even if you have a little picture of the moon that you zoomed in from some telescope and then you just put this little layer of this little gold, craft with its little flag uh man it's such nonsense i just can't get over it but uh, people love it including me now be prepared for some absolute top grade dunning kruger coming your way people yes absolute top grade dunning kruger by simon dan and we're going to just shove this one right down his throat so listen to this guys top grade dunning kruger right here it really is glorious yeah. And, and, you know, I'm also noticing the, the lack of brightness for the moon. I mean, where's that 64,000 lumens? Um, right. <laughs> that should be there. It should be absolutely blinding, um, but it's not. And, and obviously the sun's, you know, got to be coming from behind it. You know, you've got this, this placard lit up fairly well. Right. right. Um, but everything seems to be dark. And it's like, well, if the, if it's going to obey the inverse square law of light, then that moon should be absolutely, well, blinding. But does the inverse square law work when we're talking about reflective light? No, Bob, it doesn't, especially when you are that close to the object. And we've also got a square that will work when we're talking about reflective light. No, Bob, it doesn't, especially when you are that close to the object. Does the inverse square law work when we're talking about reflective light? No, Bob, it doesn't, especially when you are that close to the object. And we've also got no idea at the exposure settings of that photo. And <laughs> Simon, Dan, you are a moron, sir. All right, let's look at that. Let's look at the inverse square law. All right. So, and this is actually a better depiction right here. Um, as the inverse square law, basically what it shows is, is if you have a light source, it does not matter if it is direct or reflected, Dan. 
Um, it is all it has to have is a source and whatever brightness it is, it is. Jaron gives an example in another video we're going to show here in a minute um, that say, let's just pick uh, 100 lumens out of the air arbitrarily. OK, so what happens is that inverse square law as the light diverges out. Right. You've got original distance, original brightness. But when you double the distance, then according to the inverse square law, the brightness must go down to 25 percent of what it was. OK, now when you triple the distance, uh, you basically has, have nine times the area and it goes down to one ninth the original brightness. When you quadruple it, um, then you're looking at a four by four square or one sixteenth the original brightness. Now, as far as Dan's stupid statement that the inverse square law does not act on reflections or, or return signals or reflections or whatever, the inverse square law applies equally to not only um, direct light, uh, it applies to gravity, it applies to electromagnetic radiation, EM radiation. And here we have in Wikipedia your God reference, Dan, that says radar energy expands during both the signal transmission and also on the reflected return. So the inverse square law, uh, the inverse square for both paths means that the radar will receive energy according to the inverse fourth power of the range. Meaning, Dan, that it doesn't matter that it is a reflected light. It is still a light source, and whether that light source is reflected or not, it still has a fixed brightness to it. And from that fixed brightness, whether it is direct or reflected, Dan, it must obey the inverse square law, period. OK, now there you have some serious Dunning-Kruger from a guy that has the audacity to actually call himself Psyman Dan. Yikes. <laughs> all right, so let's go a little bit further. I think this is about all I'm going to do in this, but let's see what else he says really quick. You also got to love that it's Israel is space ill like it's sick. You know, their, their <laughs> thing crashed, they're ill and <laughs> here we go. I can't believe he would say that because I think any kind of search will tell you right away. Just one search, just, you know, is the inverse square law in effect for reflected light? And of course it is. Uh, the, the light that's reflected to you is going to diminish by the square of the distance. So, I mean, it's the same. It, it's it, You can't just say, oh, it's reflected light, so it's less light. Okay, if it's less light, then that less light will still follow the inverse square law. Yeah, well, he, he does worse than that. He says it simply doesn't apply because it's reflected. Right. So I'm, I'm curious what he would think does apply if the inverse square law does not, right? And oh yeah, that's right. He's going to make even more fun of it because of your statement about how it would be so dark. If it's this dark, literally, now think about this, people. If it is this dark, right? And we know that this this exposure is is right, right? It's not a matter of it's so bright that they've got the exposure cranked way down to dim the moon. They've got the exposure correct here. Right, because we're looking at the placard on here and the vehicle itself, and it's lit quite normally. Right, so exposure, whatever it is, is normal. And if that is true for this particular little thing that's reflecting light back, then this behind it, instead of being dark gray, blue, black, whatever the hell it is, would be bright as all get out. It would be so bright, it would be stunning. But if it was actually this dark, this close to it, then if you double the distance, whatever this spacecraft is away from it, it's going to then become uh, a quarter as dark, right? If you double it again, it's going to become like an eighth, right? It keeps going back inversely to the square of the distance. So as you go back uh, each time, and I don't know how far the, away this was, but it was on the landing approach, so it had to be um, you know, fairly close. And what right. Jaron is going to say is, is like, wow, if this is so dark here, imagine what it would be like halfway back to the earth or even, you know, several thousand miles. It would literally diminish out of our visible Correct. acuity, not because of angular size, but we simply wouldn't be able to see it because of the lighting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. But of course, he's going to make a highlight of this point that you said this and act like you are stupid in saying it. But let's listen to this. And right. it, it's sitting there completely dark as can be. I mean, I don't know how much fake this could be. Right. And if you were this close to the moon and it was only that bright, then you could do the, you know, the inverse square law working backwards and the moon would be invisible by, you know, a thousand miles. Hang on. Let's just go back a second there. What did Joan say? 
Right. And if you were this close to the moon and it was only that bright, then you could do the, you know, the inverse square law working backwards and the moon would be invisible by, you know, a thousand miles. Right. And if you were this close to the moon and it was only that bright, then you could do the, you know, the inverse square law working backwards and the moon would be invisible by, you know, a thousand miles. Absolutely clueless. Let alone what? Yeah. Absolutely clueless. You are, Dan. Now, I will admit that it probably would take a little more than a thousand miles, as Jaron stated, but the gist of the idea is absolutely correct. You wouldn't have to pull back very far at all before the inverse square law would have taken over and diminished the light completely um, out of our visual acuity. Yes, you would agree with that, Jaron? Yeah, totally. No, I was just trying to think, well, we don't know what this distance is supposedly at, but I think, don't they tell us what the distance was? I think that uh, we could probably figure out what that distance is. But yeah, again, double that distance and it's going to be ha- um, a quarter as bright. And then if you keep doing that, then I, I almost stand behind my thousand miles. But uh, I would have to know what that distance is there. But regardless, you certainly would never see the moon from the Earth. Right. Well, one thing we know is that it must be close because it's on the it's on the uh, descent. Right. Right. That's where this was taken. It's on the descent. It's on its way down, baby. So it's unlikely that it's, you know, it's probably closer than 100 miles would be my guess, even though. A uh, hundred miles and you being able to see the edge of this, it would be preposterous. See, these are the incongruities and inconsistencies that the space agencies give us. You know, if this thing, you know, looks like it would be at least 2000 miles away just because of how you can see this edge over here. Oh, well, maybe or a thousand miles away, but whatever. Right. But we don't know because um, the whole thing is convoluted. But um, so let me play this yeah, for I'd another go, minute. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'd have to go. I'd have to go back and look what they say that distance is. But I thought. If you go back to the – well, we're not looking at their video. But when you look at their video, it actually said how far away they were from the moon. I thought it was extremely close. And if, if you then say, okay, from that distance and you can call that 1,000 lumens, then you just keep doubling the distance and then it would be you know, 250 lumens or half the distance, whatever. And then keep going from there and I think it would be invisible quickly. Is, is it 1,000 miles? Could it be 2,000 miles? Could it be 5,000? Yeah, sure. If you want to say that I'm wrong about that. But if you're talking about uh, from the earth, no, you'd never see it. Right, exactly. And so so before we go in a little further than this, let me go ahead and just play this. You guys, uh, we've used this reference before, and I love this video, Jaron, because it's so spot on. But this gives you an idea of how the inverse square law works. Now, what Jaron is talking about here is how much brighter it would actually be as the astronauts are getting close to it. So it's kind of in reverse. Um, it, Jaron is, is asserting that it would be so unbelievably bright, um, you know, on the order of 65,000 lumens, Um, which if you have any idea how bright that is, it's blinding beyond belief. It's kind of like looking at the sun. Um, But so it's kind of in reverse. We're starting, instead of that, we're starting with a very dark moon and moving backwards. But here's an idea of how it works. So let's listen to Jaron on this video and uh, then we'll continue on. Now, some things could help us determine which distance was more likely to be correct. For example, the inverse square law of light that says that given a certain brightness or intensity, it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So if we know how bright the moon is, each time we half our distance, the brightness increases by four times. So you see, we can say the moon is 100 lumens, and it doesn't really matter which number we place on there, as the result will be the same. So at 240,000 miles, we have 100 lumens. At 120,000 miles, we have 400 lumens. At 60,000, we have 1,600 lumens. At 30,000, we have 6,400 lumens, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Till we get down to a thousand miles distance, when we're a thousand miles away from the moon, the lumen should be 6,553,000. So if we divide that by the original 100, we see that from a thousand miles away, the moon would be 65,530 times brighter than it is from Earth. Is that what we saw? Well, here's some photos from Apollo 17 from 800 miles from the moon. And you tell me, is that moon 65,530 times as bright as it is from Earth? Of course not. So, One thing or the other isn't true. Either we've never been to the moon or the moon is far closer. What can't be true is the moon is the distance that they tell us and that man has been there. Right. Okay. So. Well said. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. And that example is absolutely priceless because this is not even difficult math, guys. Um, You know. (laughs) Right. I suck at math. I suck at math and I can do the inverse square law. (laughs) It's a, well, apparently, Simon Dan can't, you know, oh, right. for, for stupidity reasons and also ignorance reasons that, of course, he claims oh, that the, it doesn't the moon work is on reflected reflection. light only. The moon is a reflected light. It's like, no, it's, it matters because you're talking about 
the amount of light. So it doesn't matter whether it's reflected light, a source light, whatever. The light itself, whether it's reflected or source, will diminish by you know a, the square of the distance. It's crazy. Exactly. So what Jaron was saying in this is that this moon right here from maybe a couple hundred miles away, you know, because it was on the landing descent is so dark that if you back that off to 400, it would cut that light in half. If you backed it off to 800, um, it would cut that light in half or uh, 100 to 200, 200 to 400, 400 to 800. Right. Um, and then 1600 would be the next step, but then we've cut this light down like nearly six times. So right. what Jaron said about a thousand miles, it would be very likely that the moon itself would be invisible if we are to follow the inverse square law of light, which we know is a fact, pure and simple. All right. So let's continue on. You know, 238,000. Yeah, it's interesting. What was the, do you happen to know what the moon phase uh, was on this day a couple days ago? How far off from a new moon are we? I was just wondering, wouldn't that be interesting, right? It would, Bob, but not for the reasons you think. I think you'll find that when you are only 13 miles away from the moon's surface, that moon phases are kind of redundant, and they probably would look completely different to how they look on Earth at the same time. Gee, I wonder why. Um, maybe, you know, why would they look completely different? You know, the moon is still the phase. The only thing that would look different about it is the proximity and how blindingly bright it would be, Dan. Um, so, again... You're, you're an idiot. Okay. Now let's listen and to if, this. If it's 13 miles, by the way, I don't know if you can back up to that video of mine, but if he's saying that this image is 13 miles from the moon, which I guess maybe that's true. I, I, that's what I was saying. I thought that it was pretty close, but if you go back there, okay, so stop there and look at the thousand miles was the 6 million lumens. So then we'd have to cut that down to 500 and now we'd be at 13 million lumens. Then cut that down to 250. We'd be at 26 million. I could do the math real quick. But the amount of times that that moon should be brighter than seen from Earth would be way more than what I said here. I said 65,000 times brighter. You, you, I'll just do the math real quick just because I have to see this. So at 1,000 miles, we have, uh, uh, what is this, 6553000. Okay, so if we have that and then we're going to, uh, again, we're going to, oh wait, so each time it's by four. It's even worse than I thought. I was doubling that. That's way so, worse. Yeah, so at, at, at 500 miles and I'm going to multiply that by four. And then we're going to go to 250 miles. So I'm going to multiply that by four. Then we're going to be at 125 miles. We're going to multiply that by four. Then we're going to be at, uh, what, 67 uh, miles. So we'll multiply that by four. Then we're going to be at uh, half of 67, so 33. Uh, we'll times that by four again at 33. And then half of 33 is the 17, right? So right. now we're going to times by four. So then we have that number, and we're going to divide that by the original 100. So at that position, the moon should be 268 million times as bright. So <laughs> come on. I mean, I was saying 65,000 times as bright here, but if he's talking about that image of the moon is taken from 13 miles above the moon, then the picture of the moon should be 268 million times. And I've tried to explain to people before, when you're talking about multiplying something, think about how something bright, how something is, if it's two times as bright. If something's a hundred times as bright, that's ridiculous. If you're talking a thousand times, we're talking here 268 million times as bright. And you think you'd be able to see that flag on that little craft? You wouldn't be able to see a thing. Everything would be just so washed out, completely as bright as you can imagine. 200, And the astronauts that landed there would have died immediately just because of the brightness. You'd be blind. It's ridiculous. 268 million if i got that math right and i'll have to do it again just to make sure but uh yeah every time we take that distance you'll notice i'm taking the distance down half each time we're at a thousand there you would bring it down another half to 500 miles and again we're just multiplying that six million times four then times four then times four and then at the very end we're just dividing by the hundred because that's what we started at 100 lumens again we're not saying the moon is 100 lumens you can put any number here we're just trying to figure out the factor and the factor would be at 13 miles 268 million times as bright Ridiculous. Right. Well, and I think 100 lumens is conservative from Earth, honestly. I think it's a little bit more than that. But Oh, I just made it up. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I know. Put it, yeah. Exactly. You could, put a thousand, you could put a thousand lumens there, and as long as at the end you divide by a thousand, then you're going to get your factor. So, yeah. I don't know what the lumens is. I didn't even look at it. So, if somebody's trying to say, oh, well, Jaron, you were way off. I wasn't even looking. It doesn't matter whether it's 10 lumens or whether it's a million lumens that you start at. As long as you keep your math the same and at the end divide by the original number, you're going to get the factor. Right. It's a relative scale based on inverse square law. It's as simple as that. So no matter what you start out with. So I'd say, I don't know, the, the moon is probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 lumens from here. 
Um, I'd have to put a light meter on it, but there are some nights when it's absolutely so bright. It's like, wow, it's, it's way more than a hundred lumens, um, you know, cast shadows and stuff like that. So essentially what we're saying is, is not only is Simon Dan an idiot, he can't math either. Um, so it's just, uh, absurd. And he doesn't know the first thing about the application of the inverse square law, uh, because he says point blank that it does not work on reflected light, which is utterly retarded. It most certainly does. All right. So let's go back over here and finish out the rest of this time. It was yeah. like a few days, five, six, seven days away from, or off of a new moon heading towards full. Okay. So I it believe. was waxing, waxing then. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe that's part of it, you know, because that would be really interesting since we can't obviously see a new moon. Uh, it would be really interesting to see how they portray a new moon if they were going to land a spacecraft on it. And it looks like he's going to continue with the ignorance. Does Bob think that the new moon disappears or something? And again Why, yes, Dan. Yes, I do. It does disappear on new moon. It cannot be seen for what, 40 hours, something like that? Um, yeah. So yes, Dan, Bob does think that because it's a fact. Nobody can see the moon for around 40 hours uh, around the time of the new moon. This is a fact. This is not speculation. This is not Bob being stupid. This is Simon Dumbbell being ignorant, right? That's all there is to this. So, um, all right, let's continue the last part of this and then move on. God, this guy is dumb. Again, it might not be a new moon to that lander. That lander could see the whole face of the moon. We don't know. But maybe NASA will be listening to us and actually try and make that happen. NASA are not listening to you guys. They don't even know who you are. In fact... Oh, I disagree. I think NASA absolutely is listening to us. And they do know who we are. And we have had so many examples of that. Um, that it's unbelievable. Oh, thank you, F.E. Mishka, for the uh, super chat. We appreciate that. Um, that oh, was Michelle, awesome. Too sweet. Yeah, thank you guys for all you do. Much love to you all. Thank you, Michelle, for that. So anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what rock you crawled out from, um, Dan, but uh, you are so far off on your assertions and your accusations um, and even your quote-unquote facts about who allegedly proved the rotation of the Earth. You know nothing about it. Uh, and I, I would bet dollars to donuts you know nothing about laser interferometry. Um, so the fact that you call yourself a sci man, uh, maybe sci-fi, but as a man of science is a joke because you are a joke, Dan. You know nothing about this. And right. It's so sad. I, I just was looking it up to find something. And of course, on Stack Exchange, somebody's asking about whether or not the reflection follows the inverse square law. And this person says, yeah, of course, if you have a small reflection, like the reflection of a candle in a Christmas ornament, which would be equivalent of the sunlight reflecting off of the moon, right? So if you have a small reflection, like a reflection of a candle in a Christmas ornament, you can sum the intensity of all pixels in that reflection. The sum will follow the inverse square law. It doesn't matter that it's reflected or if you're actually looking at the candle because the amount of light is dependent. Meaning if you look right at the candle, that amount of light follows the inverse square law. If you're looking at the reflection of that light in an ornament, that follows the inverse square law. Period. Yes. And we have somebody in the chat telling me to look and... Uh, because the shadows are coming into the two o'clock position, not behind the camera, whatever it's close enough. Uh, you obviously are missing the point here also, but um, whatever. So the, the fact is, and I don't know, do you have the link for that? So I can bring that up and actually show that Jaren or the stack exchange. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's no, nothing proven by something being in the stack exchange, but it's somebody answering that question, but there you go. There's the link in the uh, chat. So, you know, somebody's asking if I have a reflection I'm capturing with a camera, and what I just read is the answer. If you have a small reflection like the reflection of a candle in a Christmas ornament, you can sum the intensity of all the pixels in that reflection. The sum will follow the inverse square law. So if you have a single post cell, I don't know what that means, that pixel's intensity will follow the inverse square law. I think where he's confused is he's thinking, oh, well, a, reflection, a reflected light isn't as strong, but that's that's not the point. The point is what we're talking about is that amount of light follows the inverse square law. It doesn't matter if it's reflected or if it's the actual source light. You're talking about the amount of light that you can see. It doesn't matter how bright that original object is. That will be taken into your mathematics when you talk about what its lumens are. But it doesn't matter if the moon is reflected light or it's a source light. Regardless, it has to follow the inverse square law and does. And you can, you can do that yourself. You can test that yourself. That's right. And, and the other thing we have to deal with here is the albedo of the moon, right? 
or the amount of reflectivity that the moon gives off. Um, now, Earth obviously has a much higher albedo than the moon does. But regardless whether it's reflected or direct, if it's reflected, then you simply still take that reflected light measurement and it will still conform to the inverse square law. Correct. That's, uh, that's kind of the moral of the story is that, yeah, what, what doesn't even matter, albedo, what, anything, because you're looking at that amount of light and then that light follows the inverse square law. Reflected, uh, original, doesn't matter the, the surface reflection. It's the same thing as if somebody said, well, what about the light that reflects off the ocean from the sun? Does that follow the inverse square law? Yes, it does. Even if that light is super bright or if the, if the reflection is not too bright, regardless, you're talking about the amount of light coming off that surface that amount of light follows the inverse square law. Yep, absolutely. And shout out to Tristan711 for the super chat. He says, why do you think NASA knows you just, why do you think NASA knows you? Just curious. Well, Tristan, the reason that we think that NASA does follow us and does know who we are is because so many times we have mentioned something and NASA will come out with either a correction or a propaganda piece. And it isn't just in matters, uh, you know, relating to space. Uh, in fact, Jaron was did a uh, a thing on Stephen Hawking and his uh, what disease did he have? The which one? The Stephen Hawking's disease. What did he have? The uh, oh, a, a, uh, ALS. 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 Sorry. Right. Um, ALS. And, you know, he's talking about how the ALS webpage didn't even list Stephen Hawking as somebody that, you know, had that. And of course, after Jaron's video came out and had, uh, you know, a lot of views, um, then all of a sudden the ALS webpage changed that. Um, during the time that we were doing the ISS um, viewing parties, you know, we made several comments and then NASA would come back and either correct them or come out with a propaganda piece uh, you know, kind of explaining our objections, right? So yeah, it may be a huge coincidence, but I don't think so. It's happened too many times that yes, I absolutely do believe that NASA knows exactly what we're talking about. And it's not just us. I'm not trying to say that it's the Globebusters, you know, specifically. I know that they also were on to Robert Bassano because Robert Bassano was all over them and they were making changes department-wide. And in fact, uh, at, at, at one point they couldn't even get, Robert couldn't even get anybody to talk to him anymore because they knew full well what he was up to. So if you think that these people are not watching us, then you're sadly mistaken. They absolutely are. You always keep an eye on your composition, your competition or your opposition. And we are the opposition to NASA. Um, the entire flat earth community is. And like I said, it's not just us, but you know, we have pointed out so many things that it, to me, it goes far beyond any coincidence uh, that they just happen to make these changes after we mention them. So that's the name of that tune. That's why we think that. Okay. All right. So next up, let me see what else we got here. Um, all right. So I guess we'll leave um, Dumbbell Dan behind. And uh, <laughs> that guy, yeah. uh, unbelievable. I get so tired of his little trolls, you know, that come and do this. It's just like, it's just like Dave, Professor Dave. Um, I, you know, same story. We get trolled by that, but whatever. All right. So moving on, you, uh, uh, many of you may have seen J Tolan Media One's, uh, JT's uh, newest video that he just released yesterday on May the 4th be with you. Um, and which of course is Star Wars days. And he calls this an epic gravity experiment. Now what this is guys, this is really cool, is he, he went and he bought himself a really high precision, uh, high accuracy inclinometer that is accurate to 0 0.001 degrees, okay? And the premise behind this experiment was that um, he's saying, well, if gravity is truly changing you know, as we go around the ball with, with relation to the center of the earth, then the vector of that gravity must change. Obviously, if you're on this position of the earth, you have a vector coming in this way to the center of the earth. That's not a very good center point, but whatever, uh, as opposed to this point, as opposed to this point, they're all different, right? So what he's doing then is he's making an optical experiment where he takes this high precision inclinometer and he it lines it up with this mountain back here that also has um, some radio towers on it, right? And what he is able to do from that point is when he goes along these uh, observation locations, which let me uh, get up to 
some of the parts where he's at. He's going along this aqueduct um, that's in California. Of course, California has these all over the place, these little aqueducts. And it's not like they have a real high volume of water flow because they're mostly uh, primarily level. So it's a really, really good place to do this because he not only has the water reference to level from, but he has this high accuracy inclinometer. So he is taking several different measurements onto how much he has to change the incline uh, on that high uh, precision inclinometer to be able to determine what the gravity vector is for each of those locations. And so I'm going to let him talk about the actual results here. And uh, here's what he came up with. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be uh, a little bit on the low side. So listen up, guys, and then I'll try not to uh, blow you out of that uh, when we come back on. So let's give uh, him a listen as far as his results. Here we go. The results um, that I gathered, I recorded uh, the measurements on my uh, phone. And initially, uh, the first two sites, uh, the number varied quite a bit. And as I went along, I kind of perfected the method. That site three, I realized I need to pay a little bit more attention to how I align the telescope. So when I walked back, I redid site one and two. Now I discovered that uh, the two parallel surfaces of the rings that hold the telescope, as you can see in the lower right, are not exactly parallel. And so the inclinometer would toggle slightly. As you can see there, you can form two triangles that would be flat, right? Three points specify a, a plane. And so because the two ring surfaces on top are not quite exactly parallel, the inclinometer would toggle slightly. And so then once I discovered that, I paid more attention to it after site three. So anyway, I went back and redid site one and two. And the first column is the x-axis. So basically rotation about the x-axis, and that's the number we're in, interested in. The y-axis uh, was, you know, somewhat a, a line close to zero, a degree off here and there. Um, but uh, it's really the x-axis measurements that we're after. Now here's the incredible uh, results uh, that become apparent once we plot this data. So the green curve is what the globe says the angle should be, reference to the first point, uh, station one. But notice our data in blue, uh, it, it varies uh, due to the measurement errors, and there's the air bound, but it appears to diverge away from the green line. And if I would carry out this experiment to longer distances, that difference would become even more apparent. So what this means, folks, is that there's no variation in the gravitational vector. All the vectors are parallel. There's no divergence, which really means our world is flat. This is simply incredible, folks. The Earth is flat indeed. It is incredible. It is a mystery, but it's reality. In the lower right corner, I've tabulated the data and I've also calculated the height of the mountain I'm observing based on my measured angle that's column 3 and notice it's fairly close to the actual height of the mountain which I obtained from uh, Google Earth about 500 feet off uh, which is not bad considering the fact that uh, this is not a calibrated uh, you know telescope axis relative to uh, this inclinometer but it still works because uh, this, um, you know, bias in the calibration affects all the points. And, and this measurement technique is actually really great, you know. We can even have a slight slope to the surface and it still works as long as it is a optically straight surface we're measuring along and uh, there's no variations in the calibration of the instrument, this experiment still works. It is really incredible. So there you have it, folks. There is no divergence in the gravity vector. Thanks for watching this epic presentation, folks. Please comment down below if you've enjoyed it. That's what... All right. So there you have it. So this was, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of crude, you know, on a macro type of scale, um, but it was accurate enough to give a pretty decent uh, relative indicator on these gravity vectors, which um, show unequivocally, according to his plot here, that the vector angle is not changing for gravity. 
And that's pretty darn interesting. Just another piece of the preponderance of evidence. Um, you know, we're just going to throw that onto the pile as something else. And I'm sure this particular experiment can be elaborated on. And if I know JT, he will probably elaborate on it greatly. Um, JT is no dummy. He is a, uh, an electrical engineer by trade. Um, and in fact, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I can't really say much more than that, but let's just say that uh, uh, it's amazing what he does. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So anyway. Uh, and he can't great. even tell us much about it. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's, yeah. To, he's told me all about it, and I'm blown away. I know exactly what he does, but oh, wow. I, I cannot let that. I'll tell you after the show, but um, okay. wow. <laughs> I thought that the uh, best thing that he said there is when he said, it's a mystery, but it's reality. I, that was so well said, because wouldn't you rather have no answers and stand in awe at the mystery of all of it than to have been sat down in a desk and told that here are all the answers, we have all the answers, to later find out that they lied about reality? To me, I would rather stand in awe of reality and, and the mystery of it all than to have been told, here's all the answers, here's how everything works, here's how you li where you live, only to find out later that that's not reality at all. That's simply what they want me to believe reality is. I'd rather be dumb as they get and not understand it at all rather than to be lied to about it. Yep, that's a fact. Oh, and by the way, uh, Elysium Planitia um, making comments that... Uh, uh, the laser dry results would have been kept secret if it had not been for the documentary team being there. What an idiot. This guy must've come over from Simon Dan. Uh, no, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Elysium. I released, the, in fact, uh, within four days after that clip was made long before the movie was released, I released those uh, results publicly on Globebusters, and you can go back on this channel and find it. So again, we have another moron troll that just sits there spreading lies and propaganda, doesn't know Look the story. At these people grasping at a movie. It's I mean, unbelievable. It's so obvious, man. It's just scary. Look at them just, just reaching and grasping as hard as they can at this movie that was made. Uh, and, and yeah, and they think it's true just because it says it's a documentary. It's yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's absurd. And it's like, no, the movie had nothing to do with it. I would, people, I was fully aware that I was mic'd. Um, uh, however, right, like Bob's out telling secrets and stuff with the mic on him and just forgot, had no yeah. idea that there was a whole camera crew there filming him from across the room with his mic on. He just totally forgot and told somebody, uh, he's like, Oh man, I'm, we're hiding all this information from all the flat earthers so that we can continue to believe the earth's flat. If anybody thinks that's what we're here doing, they, they've got another thing coming. Yep. They're just, but sorry, you know. I always get that one wrong. It's, you got another think coming. Another think I coming. Say, yeah. I always think, say thing. Think again. Coming. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> And shout out to Colin Turner for the 10 pound super chat. We appreciate it. And also uh, Ram Jam Ram uh, for the super chat. We appreciate that greatly. Super. All right. So anyway, just a really good gravity experiment um, that uh, shows that the vector gravity vectors are not changing. So that kind of uh, brings me to a, another point here. Where are we? Ah. Okay. So, there's something that I want to talk about here a little bit because there are certain people in this community and, you know, many of you know who he is. I'm not going to mention his name, um, but he seems to think that the only thing and, and a lot of people think this. And, and I just want to kind of chime in on my two cents about this, about gravity forces and stuff like that. But this particular person seems to think that the only thing that matters is density and buoyancy. All right. Well, that's great. And, and I'm certainly not going to say that density and buoyancy are not a factor because they absolutely are, you know, when we're talking about what we're perceiving as gravity. Now, as I have said many times before and started saying, I don't know, I think damn near from the very first episode of Globebusters, um, you know, four years ago, that, you know, the density and buoyancy argument works great, but there is still something something that is determining up from down. Okay. So, um, I have talked about this many times about this being electrostatic force, um, and that gravity is actually an electrostatic phenomenon. But the biggest thing that, that I want to say about this is this particular person, you know, who talks about, uh, you know, the density and buoyancy and says that gravity is not a force. Um, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with that. And here's why. Um, 
and, and, and not, I'm certainly not saying that gravity, first of all, is what they're claiming it to be, either Einsteinian or Newtonian. Um, I certainly do not believe for one second that two masses, you know, irrelevant of whatever they are, um, will have an attraction to each other any more than I think that a large massive object will bend space time so that things fall into it um, and give the appearance of a gravitational attraction. No, not at all. I'm saying that there is actually a force that is being called gravity now, and, and I'm going to say that this force is absolutely real. Now, the thing that I am disagreeing with, and let me make this perfectly clear, is that it is not space-time bendature or, or mass attracting mass that is causing this force, okay? My force now and always has been that I believe that this force is electrical in nature. Now, why do I say it's a force? Okay. Because it's very simple and it's right in the gravitational equations, which by the way, um, uh, act exactly like any electrostatic or electromagnetic calculations. They happen to adhere, um, to the inverse law, uh, one, uh, not the inverse square law, but the inverse law. In other words, their power diminishes uh, inversely to the distance that they're going away from it. So, what is the what is what is g? Well, g is told to us to be nine point eight meters per second squared. Okay, now that's not in a force. That's that is an acceleration rate. Okay, now in order to have an acceleration, um, whether you want to call it a forward acceleration by stepping on the gas of your car, or you want to call it an angular acceleration by driving around in circles at the same speed, but turning your wheel, it is still an acceleration and an acceleration guys require a force. Okay. So if we look at Wikipedia here and we're looking at force and it says in physics, a force is any interaction that when unopposed, will change the motion of an object. A force can cause an object with mass to change its velocity, which includes to begin moving from a state of rest, i.e. to accelerate, okay? So what I'm saying is in order for anything to cause an acceleration, there must be a force applied to it. Um, if you are doing a, uh, 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 a jump from near outer space, like, uh, What's his name did? Uh, I always forget Felix, his name. Yeah, Felix, Felix Baumgartner. Baumgartner. Yeah. Um, you'll notice that when Felix did this, and I have a tendency to think that he probably did do this, even though there's a lot of controversy around it. Um, he started out and he quickly accelerated to a speed that was beyond supersonic. Okay. And it was not until he got lower down into the atmosphere where there actually was an atmosphere to interact with when he slowed down to the known terminal velocity or the typical terminal velocity uh, within our air uh, atmosphere, which is about 120 miles per hour. Okay. But before that 120 miles per hour, he was doing well over 700 and accelerating from the second he stepped off that platform. Um, many things uh, do exactly the same thing. In fact, everything does essentially until they hit that terminal velocity figure. Okay. They accelerate up to terminal velocity and terminal velocity is determined by uh, the viscosity of the atmosphere that you are falling through or even water that, that something could be following through, uh, falling through. Okay. That's what's determining this terminal velocity. But other than that, the force of what they're calling gravity is an acceleration, okay? So again, to have an acceleration, we must have a force. And that force is the very thing that determines up from down. It's that very, very slight bias um, that determines why when you drop something, it doesn't go floating up in the air, unless of course it is a helium or hydrogen balloon, right? Um, it's going to accelerate. Acceleration requires a force. I don't know how many times I have to say that before that becomes reality in some people's paradigm, but that's just the way that it is. Now, what is at question here is what is causing that acceleration, okay? Um, what force is causing that acceleration? And the force is 
the electrostatic force that is actually um, causing this bias. Now, uh, I covered a long time ago about um, how electrostatics or things with charged potentials affect essentially everything, right? And I even used this very demonstration um, where the guy um, is using a straw. He'll put other objects to it, towards it, and it will be attracted. You know, he's using a fork. He uses his hand. He uses a salt and pepper shaker. He uses a plastic bottle. In other words, there is no material on earth that is immune um, to electrostatic charge. Why is that? Because all things are made up of particles that have charge potential to them. Okay. That's just the way that it is. Whether you buy into the atomic structure of an atom being made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons, they are still charged particles, even if they are at equilibrium. Um, and have no charge differential, which would cause any type of current flow, okay? There's still a charge there. So electrostatic charge has an effect on absolutely everything. Now, I'm gonna go back to something that Ken Wheeler said, again, uh, in terms of talking about what gravity actually is, and he makes a really simple analogy, um, which uh, is expanded on greatly by several other physicists, but Ken was not wrong in what he said here. So let's listen to this really quick. Gravity is nothing other than dielectricity. Gravity is no different than turning on your TV set and actually shining a light off from the side and seeing the little dust particles actually head to the TV set and stick to the TV set. That's why you're shining your TV set, especially the little CRT tubes, got so dusty. The dust in the air would go gravitate to the front of the that is the exact same thing as gravity people think that that is an electrostatic charge or like you charge a balloon up and you pull someone's hair to it that same acceleration not force that same acceleration is what we ignorantly call gravity he said well if right so the acceleration and he's right it is an acceleration not a force but the acceleration is caused by a force right by the very definition of what force is right as we saw right back here on the wiki entry, okay? So that electrostatic potential is in fact the force that is causing the acceleration of this phenomenon that we identify as gravity, okay? Now, there could be other things involved in this, but you know, primarily we're going to focus on the uh, electrostatic or, or, or potentially even electromagnetic um, could do the very same thing, or maybe it's a combination of both of them. It's hard to say, right? But there is a fairly good theory out there that was put forth by the Thunderbolts project, which talks very much about this uh, electrostatic dipole alignment theory. And, you know, we covered this once before, but I'm going to get let Walt Thornhill just speak on a couple of minutes on this so that he can kind of give you a basic idea of what is exactly behind this electrostatic uh, phenomenon of gravity. Now, one thing I will say, a lot of people are going to say, no, sir, it can't possibly be electrostatic because um, you can shield off electrical potentials. Well, the problem with that is, is you're looking at it in the wrong paradigm. You have to understand that we are in this uh, electromagnetic soup, essentially, right? Um, that is static from top to bottom. And where is that? Maybe I didn't bring it up. But anyway, it talks about Feynman's discoveries here. Actually, I'm just going to play it from here uh, and the equipotential lines. I'm going to go ahead and play this really quick just so you understand that we are immersed in this electrostatic um, uh, charge soup, if you will. <laughs> this The ether or whatever is all around us. So let's listen to what Richard Feynman said about this. Going up to at least... Um of 5 million volts. Much of the following explanation is adapted from Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman's lecture on physics, a section called Electricity in the Atmosphere. For every meter you go up in the air, the voltage increases by around 100 volts, or we could say around 100 volts per yard. We can draw these voltage increases using what are called equipotential lines. Notice that the ground is negative and the sky is positive with respect to each other. Okay, so one thing you want to notice there is notice the guy is standing right in the middle of this electrostatic potential field. Now, granted, he's going to show in a little bit that these uh, equipotential lines will actually go up over the top of his head 
Um, you know, because people will say, well, how come there isn't a discharge? Well, first of all, 100 volts or 200 volts is not nearly enough uh, electromotive force or voltage to cause a static discharge. Uh, however, the potential does build up. But the bottom line is, is this all the way up to 31 miles or 50 kilometers, that 5 million volts of potential, is it kind of think of it as that that voltage potential would be like kind of being like inside of an aquarium with water in it, right? And that water would represent the electro potential charge uh, that is all around you, okay? So let's move on. And the sky is positive with respect to each other. According to Feynman, this extends upward to 50 kilometers or 31 miles, where the air is very conductive. It goes up 50 kilometers, according to Richard Feynman, or 31 miles. Um, and at 100 volts per meter, that's not... Uh... Okay, so again, I just reiterated that. And this, was, this by the way, uh, came from a clip called The Real Gravity. It's on our channel. It's also on Seventh-day Truth Seekers. But... The bottom line is, is so we are immersed essentially in this electrostatic potential that is all around us. That is the thing that sets the bias that determines up from down because it sets the acceleration um, that is required um, for this 9.8 meters per second uh, drop of objects. Now, one thing that a lot of people will also say is that, no, that couldn't possibly be it either because all objects fall at exactly the same rate in a vacuum. Well, I got news for you guys. There's evidence now that kind of contradicts that. Um, in fact, uh, I should have brought up the experiment. Uh, I know UAP has got it. He covered it on his channel. But essentially, uh, what this experiment shows, and I can tell you a little bit about this, is that there are different elements, okay, that are bounced up in this particular test. And what we find out is, is that different elements with different electrostatic charges or different uh, molecular makeup that provide different charges actually fall at different rates in a vacuum. That's something that I'm not going to go in today. However, it is a reality. There is evidence for it. And it also makes perfect sense in this uh, particular electrostatic model of gravity, okay, that that is providing the force of gravity, so to speak, uh, the force causing the acceleration. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Wal Thornhill talk a little bit about the electrostatic dipole effect that causes the gravity. And essentially what Walt is going to tell you here, or Wall is going to tell you here, is that because we are inside of this electromagnetic soup and the, what will happen is all things within this, this pool of electrostatic potential will line up electrostatically in a dipole effect. Kind of look at it um, as a... Uh, a stacking of magnets on top of each other, north to south, to north to south, to north to south, to north to south, okay? You get the idea. They will stack up uh, and in the same way where on these molecules, um, you have plus to minus to plus to minus to plus to minus. However, because the nucleus of uh, atomic structures is roughly about a thousand times more massive, right, than the charged particles around it, especially like the electrons and stuff like that, what it does is it gives a slight deformation atomically that becomes cumulatively um, over this chain of plus minus plus minus plus minus stuff. Okay, so um, before we do that, actually, Iru just popped in. So let's say hi to Iru. And uh, how are you doing today, Iru? Fine. Hello, everyone in the chat. Hello, guy, you. Uh, hello to you guys <laughs> on the on the show. So I, I just gonna keep a little bit quiet and trying to uh, get into the the subject because I was I, I was outside with some uh, minor issues with my grandmother. You know about it. Mm -hmm. So 92 years old, uh, she has uh, some you know difficulties in in he, in her health. So nothing. I, I just came from the hospital and I want to try to uh, get into the, the show. So okay. thank you, everyone, to, to having me on. Okay, no problem. Well, you know, I wish I, I think I'd be doing really good if I lived anywhere near that. Um, I, I'll be happy if I make it another 15 years, to be honest with you. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly man. Exactly. You know, she's, she's so well in terms of the, the brain, you know, she's very consciousness. Uh, but he suffered a, a problem in the hips, you know, at that age is typically that you broke uh, the hips. So it, it's just that. But he, she was in the hospital and blah, 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 blah. So 
uh, I don't want to interrupt it. I'm going to try to get into the subject. Okay, sounds good. And also a uh, shout out to Tristan711 says, can you talk about the mountain shadow cast it up? Uh, Jaren, if you can remind me of that in a few minutes, we certainly do have an answer for that. That's a pretty easy sure. answer, but uh, we'll get to that after we cover this. Um, so thank you, Tristan711, uh, both for the super chat and the question. We'll uh, see if we can get to that in a minute. But um, anyway, back to, also I saw another comment that somebody was not buying the acceleration from plus to minus, plus to minus to plus to minus. That isn't what's causing the acceleration. Um, that's only how the dipole effect is stacking up. The acceleration is caused by the charge potential, not because of the molecular stacking. But I'm going to let Walt Thornhill uh, talk about this a little bit more, and then I'll try and elaborate on it. We're not going to go too deeply into this because I've covered this many times before, uh, and it is on several uh, past episodes of Globusters. But here's Walt Thornhill kind of giving an idea of how this electrostatic dipole effect causes gravity. Here we go. So what causes gravity? The gravitational mass equals the inertial mass. That's lifting and pushing. So much the same mechanism is responsible for gravity. Now, atomic electrostatic dipoles, as I've talked about with the London force and so on, are formed by most atoms inside the Earth with the inner pole positive and the outer pole negative. The reason is that gravity is pulling on the nucleus. You can't shield gravity. That's the point. So the fact that the electron's down there doesn't matter so much, except that it holds the nucleus back from moving in the gravitational field. The nucleus is about 1,800 times heavier than the electron. So if it moves in the direction that gravity is pulling it, then the atom is distorted, as I've shown there, which means that the bottom end of that atom is more positive than the end nearest the surface, which is more negative simply because the electron spends more time out at the top of the curve and a short amount of time at the bottom. So, the electric field produced within the atom distorts the subatomic particles. So, the particles within the atom, the nucleus and the electron, are all distorted similarly by a very tiny amount. And this is the distinction between the gravitational force and the electric force. The amount of distortion is infinitesimal, 10 to the minus 38, 10 to the minus 39 times the gravitational force. So, it is the sum of all of the aligned subatomic dipoles that produces the profoundly weak force of gravity. And the fact that they're held by the molecular forces, which is far stronger, means that the atom can't move, the nucleus just sits there and everything's in balance, but there is this weak electric dipole force which is transferred through the body. Okay, so what Wall is saying then is that obviously it's not, baking, it, it's not breaking the molecular bonds, but what it's doing is it's drawing the nucleus, which has a mass of roughly, you know, a thousand plus times uh, higher than the electrons orbiting it, it's drawing it down to cause an ever so slight distortion um, and bias downwards towards the Earth in all of these um, uh, all of these molecular constructs, the di the dipole alignment effect or the plus minus plus minus plus minus. Uh, obviously, this part doesn't change. The only thing that's being distorted slightly is the nucleus. Now, this is a very, very good theory, I think, and they elaborate on this very much. And I'll leave the links to this. Um, but Wall actually goes much further in, in uh, depth on this as to how this works. And it is so much more understandable and demonstrable in a lot of ways um, over gravity because gravity is something that is absolutely... <laughs> Well, it's, it's fictional as far as, you know, mass attracting mass. We cannot detect any gravitational wave unless you want to buy the nonsense relativity-based LIGO, um, you know, which gives you a chirp from a, uh, an event that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Utterly ridiculous, but we still can't detect any of these gravitational fields, um, you know, from the moon or any other object right here in our local uh, solar system. So this is actually much more demonstrable, much more understandable, uh, much more realistic. 
uh, I think it has it all over, you know, Einsteinian or Newtonian gravimetric models, um, which are basically based in fantasy. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, Einstein himself uh, was in doubt of his uh, special relativity and general relativity. And Newton did not want to be associated with the idea um, that all of these masses were causing these attractions to each other. Um, you know, that got blown so far out of proportion that it was just utterly ridiculous. So, you know, electricity is something that is demonstrable. It's something that is worked with daily. Um, so is magnetism. And it is, and all of these phenomenon fit right into the very descriptions that we give gravity, including people, the, the inverse force that it falls off with, right? It obeys very much the exact same well, in fact, it's identical in formula to gravity, right? Uh, as far as how the power or the potential varies off with distance, right? So um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this. But the bottom line is, is that gravity, whatever it is, is indeed a force, right? There has to be a force that is applied that causes this, this acceleration, right? You cannot have acceleration without a force, right? So density and buoyancy by themselves are not going to cut it. it. It just, there has to be something there that sets that initial bias potential for up from down. Um, and I hope people understand that. But, you know, those who, who go on and say, well, we don't need gravity uh, because everything works fine with buoyancy and density. I'm sorry, it does not because you cannot explain the acceleration that is taking place when you drop things from a very high place. Um, any comments on this, guys? Yeah. First of all, in terms of the legal uh, experiment, uh, you know, the relativist guy, they need to prove that a wave exists without a medium. Because the people imagine this kind of, you know, uh, laser uh, type of effects where, you know, the gravitational wave is like shooting like, a, you know, like a wave. No, no, you are not able to do that, you know. First of all, you need to define and prove that waves exist without a medium. So if the gravitational wave come 30 billion years away from the collapse or, or the crash of or two black holes, uh, and that is they trying to invent this nonsense uh, theory about the space-time being, a, you know, like a, like a fabric of, you know, because they need a medium to propagate a wave. Because the wave in itself, it doesn't exist. It's, it's just a concept. It's not, uh, it's, it's like talking about information, you know. I mean, there are just human concepts. There are not physical objects. So that is in terms of this uh, wave uh, thing about talking about the, the detection of gravity waves. So you need to <laughs> show a wave, you know, first of all, and you need to prove that uh, you have uh, you need to prove a medium uh, to have that gravitational wave, and of course, in the theory of the outer space based on the heliocentric model, they talk about the uh, it's empty, it's without properties. So it's really difficult to conceive those notions. You know, they trying to all the time to get confused that no, because it's the boss, the the the, the particle is the uh, Hig, uh, the boson Higgs or uh, you know, they change all the time names uh, of the ether. You know, they're trying to change the concept of there is some kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a fluid, uh, uh, you know, thing out there uh, propagating waves or inside here, I mean. Uh, but that is the first thing. The second thing is that the, uh, I forget the second thing. So I'm going to leave to Jenna. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. No, it. no, my pleasure, man. Go ahead. No, I, I get so you know, uh, I, I didn't grow up uh, to speak English, so that is why I leave you with the second thing. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Uh, no, I mean I need to look into this a little bit more because uh, even watching back what Bob just said uh, already, um, I'll have to watch it again to to see what exactly what he means because I I'm somebody who still thinks. Um, that necessarily doesn't need to be a force, but uh, based on what Bob just said, I, I'm now kind of changing my mind a little bit, so I'll have to watch that again. 
Okay. Yeah, I remember the, the second thing. I remember the second thing uh, was uh, based on the acceleration. You need a force to have acceleration, and that is completely. Right. I, I completely agree. But uh, this is my is just a personal uh, question because we have the, the terminal velocity, you know, supposedly. I right. mean, you, you, you drop an object 10, 100 kilometers up there. And if you can imagine that we have the, you know, we can produce, uh, we, we can, you know, take out of all the air to doesn't have any friction. It's going to keep accelerating that object or it's, or it's going to reach a terminal velocity where the acceleration is not anymore there. Are you talking about in a vacuum or not? Yeah, in a, in, the, in a vacuum, not a vacuum, but supposedly, you know, which a human can produce as a vacuum. Hmm. It's yeah. going to be keep, it's going to, I mean, the, to, to leave clear the question. If I have an object 100 kilometers up and I, you know, drop down, uh, I, I leave that object fall in a vacuum, you know, without any resistance, the object is going to keep accelerating its velocity. Or it's going to reach this supposedly terminal velocity. Exactly, and th that is exactly the entire point. Uh, Iru. Hold on, I think that Iru wasn't that a question. Yeah, and I did. I didn't make as a question. No, no, you did. I think Bob just said exactly, but I think ah. what, he's, what he's asking is a question, Bob. And I have the same question, so I guess uh, I'm looking for an answer. Okay. Yeah. Bob. I'm. I don't think I got the question, but let me let me say what I was going to say about. <laughs> Well, um, real quick, he was saying if he drops an item from uh, 100 kilometers and in a vacuum mm -hmm. and it is falling, will it continue to accelerate forever or will it eventually reach a terminal velocity? Well, the only thing, it, theoretically, you know, theoretically, it would it would accelerate forever. However, I, I, okay. I'm hesitant to say that. And the reason I'm hesitant to say that is because you guys know full well my position on the fact that that I believe we are in a contained environment here. Um, I mean, anybody, I, I don't understand how people cannot understand that, that we're in a contained environment, uh, you know, for the, the, the air pressure, if nothing else, right? How can you right. have a pressure inside, uh, uh, you know, next to a vacuum unless there's something that's containing it? That's one thing that, that tells me to do this. So, so uh, really, it's more of a, of a mind experiment than it is anything practical. Pretty much, but we do have practical examples um, in the uh, you know the the space jump experiment uh, uh, you know where he accelerated past supersonic, and then once he got into the atmosphere, he started slowing down. Now somebody made the comment uh, in the chat that that if you lift something up and drop it, you're the force. No, I disagree with that. You are not the force. The force is what's causing the acceleration once you do let go of that object. Sure, I can take something up to the top of a building, and that's me all the way taking it up there and letting it go, but something else is acting upon it for it to accelerate beyond the zero velocity when it leaves my hand to when it hits the ground. Now, the only other mitigating circumstances behind that is that if there is an atmosphere or water right? That will slow down the descent of that, right? That would mm -hmm. then define a terminal velocity. And obviously a terminal velocity in water would be different than it would be in air, uh, depending on the viscosity of the medium. But for something to accelerate, it is a foregone conclusion and a scientific fact that a force must be applied to an object to cause an acceleration, period. Okay. There's no arguing that. And that's why I'm saying that what that that force is that's causing that acceleration is the electrostatic potential difference that is literally causing a a static charge attraction, much like a magnetic charge attraction. Same thing with a magnet. You can have a big magnet in the middle, have like a metal object towards the outside. And if you let go of the object, it will start moving towards that magnet kind of slowly, depending on what the friction is, right? And then it will get to a point where it just goes, whoop, bam, and it goes right to that magnet. In other words, it's accelerating into that magnet, right? And that force is the magnetic force. The same thing is happening with the electrostatic potential, right? Gravity has nothing, you know, gravity as far as mass attracting mass is just stupid and it's out of the question. But things that we right. can define, which electromagnetic and electrostatic potentials, we know do exactly the same thing. Um, 
And let's see, Ute says, Globusters, what about densities falling in water? Falling at rates dependent on density. Vacuum chambers are used to hoax it. Um, well, yeah, that's that's exactly right. You Again, it's dependent on density uh, to to come up with that that uh, terminal velocity, right? But otherwise, uh, under any, uh, under the circumstance of a vacuum, and even partially in an air or water environment, there is an initial acceleration from the time that you let that object go uh, until it hits its so-called terminal velocity. All right. So that's I, my point. Go ahead. And, and my my question, uh, maybe I, I know that I didn't elaborate so well. So thank you, Sharon, for translate my own always. English. I'm always uh, here for it. Thank you, man. But my my question is also based on the supposedly if you take if you take uh, you know a really heavy object that you know take uh, away all the air. Uh, supposedly we drop, you know, you can imagine a, a, a tank. You know, a war tank from the a Panzer tank from 100 kilometers up. Uh, it has, you know, the so much uh, weight that uh, is able to, uh, you know, um, uh, dissipate the the air friction a lot. But right. it's going to reach a terminal velocity also. In a, in a vacuum. No, no. I mean, even right now in in our own uh, setup world, you know, okay. uh, it's yeah. like the it's like the example when you drop um, <laughs> a book. It's okay, uh, a book, you know, and a paper. Of course, the book is gonna fall much quickly than the paper because the paper is has more air resistance. But if you put the paper, uh, you know, the the paper, the sheet of paper on uh, on the top of the book, and you drop it. Both fall fall at the same time. You, you follow me? Right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now, if you drop a, a really heavy object from from a plane, ten kilometers up, it's gonna reach also the terminal velocity. Correct. Even that, even that, this object, you know, had the property to uh, go beyond the the air friction. It's gonna reach the terminal velocity. It's never gonna pass that terminal velocity. It's Correct. never going to keep accelerating. Right, because it's acting as an opposing force, precisely. Okay. Or I, I don't know if it's an opposing force so much as it is a resistance uh, to the the primary force. But regardless, but it's, it's, uh, what, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say, or and, and uh, it's just a question. It's just, you know, dropping my, my thoughts on the table. It's like uh, you have a really heavy object, you drop it, start in zero velocity, is keep, you know, accelerating, accelerating. So that object has the property to bypass the air friction because it's keep accelerating, but it's going to reach a point that it's like uh, there is no any uh, acceleration going on. It's like reach that acceleration and stop. It's like something right. strange. If you have a really a force accelerating on that, uh, acting on that acceleration. Right, exactly. And that force is uh, ultimately being nullified by the resistive or the opposing, um, I, I don't want to say forces, but let's just say the resistance to it, uh, the resistance of the air. Okay. So um, unless I'm missing something, am I missing something that you're trying to say here? Or, um, no, I, no, no. Maybe maybe <laughs> I, I, I get confused, you know, uh, I confuse with my lack of uh, language but uh, no no it's just that i mean for me it's really something really strange that uh, the object reach a terminal velocity even that uh, this object can uh, they, they have the property to bypass air, air friction it's right, just you're that. saying something really heavy like a, a tank versus a ball or yeah you know, a exactly. baseball or something right exactly uh, right. you know you have the initial conditions with where this object bypass their friction because it's keep accelerating but it's reach a it's reach you know like a this terminal velocity and then it, 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 it stop accelerating right and that's when the, the force is essentially offset by the resistance okay um okay. And, and that's what's actually happening and theoretically in a vacuum theoretically um it would continue to accelerate and accelerate and accelerate you know, to what level, I have no idea. But this gets into areas where I don't really want to speculate on it because we have right, no way to test it. it. 
Exactly. Do it. There's no way to make it a never ending vacuum. Now they'll have you believe that space is that never ending vacuum, but uh, I don't believe that that exists. There's no way that we can exist in a vacuum uh, with the atmosphere attached to the earth. And, and everybody's heard that argument many times. So that's why I think this gets into a little bit of a hypothetical or a thought experiment, because um, if you're just going to believe in that vacuum that we, which again, I like what uh, Mitchell from Australia said when he said, if it wasn't for humans being here on earth, that no vacuum would exist. And I tend to agree that the vacuum exists because we, we created it. Uh, they just want you to then believe that the outer space around us is also a vacuum, but uh, I have, I have no proof of that. Right now think yeah. about this for a second, guys. Uh, and I just thought of this just now. But the ISS, right, or anything in orbit is technically falling around the object that it's orbiting, correct? Okay, so if there is nothing that causes a resistance, um, then the acceleration of gravity, even in, in whatever model you use, um, if it's bolting forward at 17,500 miles per hour, that must mean that at some point it also has to be falling at that speed. Now, since there is technically no atmosphere up there, why doesn't it keep accelerating beyond that 17,500 miles per hour and fall into the earth, right? That's kind of an interesting right. thought, isn't it? Or fly <laughs> off into space, which is the or same fly thing. fly off, yeah. Exactly. Right, which is fly the same off. thing for the earth going around the sun, which is, uh, you know, why wouldn't it just fly off into space? Right, but, but again, like I said, if there is an acceleration 9.8 meters per second squared, that means that every second that it's going up there, that velocity is being squared, which means unless they are compensating it by going forward, then theoretically at some point it, the velocity is going to be so high in a downward vertical direction that it seems to me that it would have to crash into the earth. But, right, well, you that's know. why they have the curvature of space-time. <laughs> that's why though because it has to be it has to be the cause of it otherwise that would happen so it needs to be that the mass is curving space time and that things are falling within that curved space the fabric the fabric of space time <laughs> all right well there you have it <laughs> anyway it's all bullshit none of it makes any yeah, sense yeah. and uh so but anyway i did want to say that about gravity because you know whatever gravity is um it is a thing right? Whether it's caused by mass attracting mass or electrostatic or electromagnetic potential. Um, you know, we all have our thoughts on that. But um, regardless of the fact that uh, you cannot walk away, the one thing you cannot walk away from is that in order to have an acceleration, whether vertically, um, uh, curvature wise, uh, whatever, linear, uh, curve linear, whatever, it requires a force to accelerate. And you cannot just drop something and say that there's not a force acting on it if it's going to keep accelerating, which, you know, to some level, we can demonstrate that. Like I said, you know, Felix Baumgartner, and I tend to believe that was probably right. And it, it, and it makes common sense. And that's the most important thing for me is the common right. sense factor of it. So there you have it. Well, yeah, I've always been somebody that uh, believes just strongly in the relative density of it all. But now that you've worded it that way, I'll have to do a little bit of uh research on that and get back to you next week because I, I can't argue with it right now the, the way that you're saying yeah a force would require uh or you would need a force in order for something to continue accelerating correct so um i'll have to think about that yeah and and, and also maybe i get I, i'm wrong when what uh, i'm going to say but it the same thing that happened with them with mass you know this well mass it, it's another concept nobody show mass but what what we understand as mass uh, it has this uh, terminal velocity, and the, thing, the, the same thing happened with the electromagnetic uh, um, wave. I mean, when we talk about the speed of light, uh, nobody measured the uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. Nobody. They measure like 298.237 kilometers per second because it has, you know, this permeability and permeability uh, situation when you trying to uh, measure, you know, uh, electrical field or magnetic field. It has like a terminal velocity also. You never reach the 300,000 kilometers per second. That is supposedly if here on Earth without a vacuum, this electromagnetic wave reach this velocity, almost 300,000 kilometers, supposedly it must be that in outer space, without any kind of resistance, 
it's going to reach the 300,000 kilometers per second. But nobody measured that. Exactly. We, still, we, we, still, we still measure under that number. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we have no we have no vacuum chamber to even try and and, and disprove or prove that. Um, but really, if you start following the more, I guess, the different thinking on it, like the, the Ken Wheeler or, um, you know, some of the other people where they talk about light um, is not a speed. It's not moving from one point to another, but it is a rate of induction that occurs yes. between two polarized points, right? Um, yeah. And then in this case, you know, like I said, you've got the Earth as ground, you've got the firmament in my model or in my idea uh, as the anode of this. And so what's happening is there is a rate of induction where this light um, essentially becomes manifest. It's not like it's traveling, it's simply becoming manifest and it's a rate of induction through this ether uh, which a lot of people, you know, have a real hard time accepting, but is absolutely there. And of course, that's yeah, a whole but, other. But but if failure. you launch a if you launch a craft supposedly, of course, at Mars, uh, don't they just set it at you know? Okay, we're gonna burst into to space at fifty five thousand miles per hour, whatever it is, and then the craft is supposedly supposed to maintain that fifty five thousand miles per hour through space on its way to Mars, correct? So right, I'm it's... confused as I'm confused as to where we get this. Uh, if it's being attracted to Mars uh, as to some sort, and I'm just, again, this is just supposedly based on their model. If Mars is gravitationally attracting this craft, then why doesn't it also increase its speed um, at that rate? Well, or the, whatever. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be 9.8 meters per second. I understand that. But wouldn't it have to increase speed as it, as it moves along yes. towards that? Yes. And, yes. and theoretically, that is exactly what supposedly happened. Take uh, Halley's Comet for an example, right? It goes out 50, 60 years in opposite direction, um, then finally slingshots back, and it's coming right at the sun. Um, and it is accelerating all the time that it's coming towards the sun. Of course, why it's not accelerating directly at the sun is anybody's guess. But then the theory right. goes, as the theory goes, as that comet is coming around, it makes a very close proximity pass to the sun at such a high velocity that it, it actually does not get drawn into the sun. Um, and the gravitational effect doesn't actually start drawing it to it until it goes past it and turns it around and slingshots it around the sun. So theoretically, yes, that is supposedly happening, Jaron. But in order to get out of Earth's gravitational pull, you have to be doing Mach 33, which is 25,000 miles per hour. And then, you know, after that, whatever numbers they want to make up is, is what they're going to feed you. So anyway. <laughs> it's it's all such utter bs i mean yeah you, you 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 try to tell a story based on his on their argument so you know it's really difficult because right, it becomes kind of, impossible you, i hate to yeah, even, even exactly, think that way exactly exactly if we have you know uh song everybody calls ether but for me what is really uh impressive is that we have something that uh, cause resi resistance to electromagnetic waves. So we have some kind of medium to propagate that property of electricity and magnetism. Yes, uh, exactly. You, you can call you can call ether. You can call whatever you want, but there is something up, uh, you know, inside of this uh, plane of existence that interact with this, uh, you know, element of the nature, which is an electromagnetic wave. There is, no, it doesn't exist light in itself. When you see a light bulb, you know, uh, turning on, it, it's not light inside there. It's, the, it's gas, which is, uh, you know, excited by ele electrical fields. But there is no light. In the nature, outside, you have the same property when the lighting, you know, uh, a lighting happen in the sky. is the, the, the light that you see from a lighting is the gas in the atmosphere, which is was exciting. There is no a, a, a thunder... Uh, thunderbolt, you know, going in, uh, uh, exists in self. I don't know if I, I know it. Today I have some troubles to explain myself, but uh, there is nothing uh, out there called light. Right. right. And it, it's certainly, I seriously doubt it's a particle too. And I know some people would take some huge exception with that. Um, but, you know, that's another discussion for another day, right? <laughs> yeah. No, you have the, Christ, you know, for the outside, the guy that who, who like the history, you know, Christian Huggins, 
determinate that there, there is supposedly a wave. It's not based on particles. Yep, exactly. But so, so you Bob, know, if, if they took a golf ball from the space station and threw it towards Earth, you're saying that it would accelerate all the way until it hit the atmosphere? Yes. At, at 9.8 meters per second squared? Theoretically. It wouldn't, just, it, it wouldn't just maintain its given speed until it reached it? Nope. It would be accelerated towards it because it has an attractive force on it. Now, right. I, and I'm not sure that that exists. That's kind of what I'm saying is that I'm not sure. I think what happens here is that you've got this idea of space, which they want you to believe in. And so they've created a vacuum here on Earth, which is man-made. It's not natural. It's not nature made. It. It's man-made. And then they're having the things perform in that vacuum in a limited space and then are trying to apply that to a make-believe medium. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're talking hypothetically here, obviously, because of none of, of us believe that uh, this outer space thing in the first place. I certainly don't because right. I believe we're domed, we're covered. So no, there's no space in my... But if we're talking, talking hypothetically, hypothetically, then hypothetically, there is nothing in between you know, throwing it from the ISS, you know, where there's virtually no atmosphere. Obviously, there's some because it goes out beyond the moon now, 400,000 miles. Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah, right, whatever. But um, essentially, at that point, the gravitational attraction or electrostatic attraction in my model, right, would be still drawing that golf ball towards it, and it would be accelerating, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot a lot to think about. I, that's something I haven't yet considered that uh, the more I'm thinking about it simply does not work in their model. So I'll have to dig a little deeper into that. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I, I think about this stuff all the time. And, um, you know, like I said, I wouldn't have even brought this up, but there's somebody, and we know who he is. I'm not going to mention him, but he really, really does not believe that there's any force that, that needs to be there to cause an acceleration. And it's simply a violation of the laws of physics um, for there not to be one. Okay. And that's very demonstrable. So whatever, just wanted to bring it up in case other people were starting to take on that line of reasoning, which I think is entirely folly. And this person knows that too. I've told him that many times, uh, as have many people. And, and I get where he's coming from. I truly do. But you cannot get past the acceleration. That is the thing that, I mean, if it stayed at one speed, that might be one thing, but it's accelerating, which means there has to be a force on it. End of story. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So moving on. <laughs> and uh, the last thing, Oops. the last thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. We must, we must be remembered that anytime we talk about gravity, you imagine like a, a, a attracting force, but it could be also a pushing force, like an atmospheric pressure. I mean, when Tesla be. says it could be. So we don't need to stack just in one way to see this uh, thing called gravity, like it's something attracting another object. Because uh, like Newton himself uh, says, uh, the, the object move because something are pushing there, not because something are attracting there. So when we talk about gravity, uh, it doesn't uh, to be something like there is something in the center of the air attracting that. Could be something uh, up from above pushing down the things yep yep very good so okay so anyway um i i just wanted to make that point clear and i think i did you know and maybe we'll elaborate on it uh further at some point but uh you know you, you got to overcome the inertia you can't get past that as racer f you just said um and you know when you have an acceleration you know that's opposing that inertia um, that, that's something that, that can only be dealt with by the idea of a force, um, you know, providing uh, the, uh, the force to overcome the standstill inertia and also to accelerate the inertia or the object that's already in motion. So, all right, cool. So let's move past that. And next thing I want to cover is um, I want to let everybody know that Rick, the guy that uh, originally bought the um, DSP-1760 fiber optic gyro, came out with a really nice piece um, just this morning, in fact, uh, called Fiber Optic Gyro Q&A Stanyak Effect, both rectilinear and angular motion. Uh, it's about an hour and 10 minutes long. I'll probably wind up mirroring on Globusters because um, he kind of takes all of the best parts where I've explained the Fiber Optic Gyro and also the research that, his done, that he has done 
and um, you know, kind of compacted it into this uh, hour long uh, feature that kind of talks about what's going on with the fiber optic gyro, which is something we're going to be doing a lot more experiments with. Um, and of course, the whole idea, one of the biggest things that he covers in this is the fact that, uh, you know, I've said many times, uh, the ballers are more than happy to accept the idea that the Michelson Gale experiment and the Saniac effect and, um, you know, Bob in Behind the Curve <laughs> uh, have registered a 15 degree per hour rotation, even though I didn't do anything of the kind, but uh, that the fiber optic gyro picked up a 15 degree per hour uh, rotation. Um, and they're more than happy to accept that. But when it comes to the Michelson Morlika experiment, which is talking about linear motion, okay, rectilinear motion or motion in a straight line, uh, the Sanyak effect still absolutely 100% applies. Um, it's just a fact. There are scholarly articles on it. Um, uh, there's so much evidence, it's it's really overwhelming. But uh, take a look at this. I'll have it in the show notes. And this will give you kind of a technical overview of what we're talking about, about why you cannot ignore Michelson-Morley if you're going to accept Sanyak and Michelson-Gale. Um, you just can't do it. They're one in the same phenomenon. Okay. So, and with that, what I want to do, I want to bring up this funky little thing right here. And this guys is the interface to the dsp 1760 now we're going to be taking this this guy and i've got it hooked up here on my desk i should have had a camera but it it's a it's a little round thing it's just not much i will show actual video of the device as we're using it in experiments but um the bottom line is what we have here is we have the interface which allows us to do data logging um, from certain times, start and stop time. We can convert things to ASCII or CSV. Uh, we have the settings, um, you know, for any specific configuration that we want to put in. Um, we can have specific uh, sensor information that we can pre-program into this uh, fiber optic gyro. Um, this will look at the sensors um, individually. We've got uh, like temperature, magnetometer, accelerometer, gyro uh, sensors. We can run diagnostics on it, all that fun stuff. And of course, here we have all the manuals, which I'll even put a link for the uh, DSP-1760 tech manual so people can look at it. But as far as what we're looking at right now is the dashboard. And what we're going to what we're seeing here is a, an artificial horizon indicator. Now, this is something that is in virtually every aircraft there is. Um, helicopter, airplane, glider, whatever, um, because what it does is it gives you three axis of indication, you know. Now, the way that it's set up right now, um, look at these black lines right here and the dot in the middle and the black line going to each side. And imagine those as the wings of the aircraft, okay? And this dot in the middle is the nose of the aircraft or a point on the horizon. So, if you are flying and you pull back on the stick or back on the yoke, your nose will go up and this particular indicator will go up into the blue area. If you dive, um, you push forward on the yoke, it will go down into this area. If you do a rudder maneuver, which will give you a yaw axis, this particular little white dot and the scale, the white scale behind it will rotate to the left or to the right. And if you do a roll maneuver, um, these wings will literally um, bank to the left and bank to the right. Let's see how that actually works. So I'm going to start it. We have it connected to the fiber optic gyro. And I'm going to go ahead and start it. It's firing up. And we're going to see down here immediately that we are going to have some uh, pitch, yaw, and roll changes. And essentially what we're picking up down here um, is the pattern of the ether itself. But beyond that, let me take you on a little flight that I'm going to do here. So if I pull back on this yoke, eh, let me get this the right way. Eh, it might help if I had it in the right direction. Okay. So if I pull back, you see that what I'm doing is I'm tilting the fiber optic gyro back. So I'm essentially emulating a nose climb position, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30 degrees. Okay. And if I push forward on it, it goes into a dive. 
Now, if I bank to the left, that's showing the uh, wings relative to the horizon banking to the left. And if I bank to the right, now we've got the rings, wings relative to the horizon banking right. And if I use the rudder, which is the yaw, uh, then you can see the white line behind it. And you can also see up here the, well, let's, let's zero this out again. You can see this going back and forth. If I turn it to the right, it's going minus 17, da, da, da. and if we turn it to the left, it's going positive. So this is showing us our, our rotation of axis, both for roll, pitch, and yaw. And like I said, every aircraft... Wait, which one's, which one's the one on the top? That's Z-axis then? The one you reset? Z is yaw. Um, well, okay. when I reset it, I reset everything. So right. Z is on the top. That's yaw. Okay. okay. And then the Y is the pitch axis, which is this. Pitch up. Pitch, pitch gotcha. nose up, pitch nose down. And the other one is the roll axis, which is roll to the left, roll to the right. Okay. okay I got you. Sorry, I'm not doing this too well because I'm kind of doing it with the, with the thing bulky. But this is what this instrument does, right? It gives you um, pitch in, uh, it gives you pitch, yaw, and roll on three different axes. Uh, not only does it do this fiber optic wise, but it also has accelerometers inside of it, um, you know, for further precision and calibration. But um, this thing is literally mounted or, or strapped. It's a, called a strap down mount, I believe, um, because it's not floating on any gimbals or anything like that. It's literally like bolted onto the frame of the aircraft. So when the aircraft turns left, you will get that. When the aircraft turns right, you will get that. When the aircraft noses up, you will get that. When the aircraft noses down, you will get that. When it banks left, you'll get that. And when it banks right, you get that. Okay. So all of these things are at what this is picking up. Now, if you look down here, you can see that the roll pitch and yaw are, are changing ever, ever so slightly. Now, part of this has something to do uh, with temperature, uh, barometric uh, factors, but what it mostly has to do with is the motion of the ether around it. And if you actually plot these, um, what's interesting is if you kind of visualize it in your mind, what you see is the ether is taking on a toroidal type of pattern, which is very interesting because that's exactly what magnetic fields do. But the ether, um, you know, as we said many times, is counterspatial or it operates at 90 degrees from every single point along a magnetic point, okay? Now, I don't expect everybody to grasp that off the top of your head, but the bottom line is, um, oh, I'm sorry, Rick said there aren't any accelerometers in the fog. My bad, Rick, thank you for correcting me on that. I thought there were. So there are no accelerometers in the fog. We're simply using the uh, the Sanyak effect in three different axes, okay? So um, that's what I wanted to show. Now, we're, what we're gonna be doing is we're going to be taking this fog um, up in the mountains with us, and we're gonna go camping this summer, and we're gonna take it to different places that have extreme elevation differences on the same latitude line. And what we're looking for and what we're gonna try and plot is the differences in this etheric flow, right? As we get, you know, either further from the surface or closer to the surface, and this will give us a, a better idea of what we're actually looking at. So we're going to try and expand the, uh, uh, I don't want to say horizon. <laughs> uh, we're just going to expand the area that we're that we are detecting, uh, you know, with certain knowns of it. So, um, as you can see, it's it's very simple. It just just gives you these uh, yaw pitch and roll axes, and it's very very precise in the way that it does it. And uh, uh, like I said, it's doing this via the Sanyak effect. And in Rick's video that he pulled up here this particular video, um, not only does he explain all of this, but again, he explains all the theory behind it uh, in some of the clips that we've taken. Also, some of the scholarly paper, recent scholarly papers, by the way, guys, that are uh, kind of going along with the, the model that we're presenting. So that's just something that I want everybody to check out. It's over on Rick's uh, Seventh-day Truth Seekers page uh, channel. I will more than likely mirror it onto ours, but this is very important if you're following this and you're really interested in whether or not I actually did prove the rotation of the earth, then this is something you're not gonna wanna miss. And as always, 
Uh, we encourage you to do your own research on this. There's a ton of material out there. Um, there's a great website, a guy uh, uh, called Conspiracy of Light um, that has a website that does some fabulous uh, interferometer tests um, that actually we have been in contact with him and asked him a lot of questions, in addition to a couple of professors that specialize in laser interferometry. Um, and suffice it to say, guys, we're pretty confident that we are not wrong on this and we are uncovering this step by step, the deception that has been perpetrated on mankind for over a hundred years, going back to the original Michelson-Morley, Michelson-Gale, Sanyak, Aries failure, all these experiments. And this is why um, FE Core is interested in reproducing these experiments in a modern day uh, environment with modern day scholars that have much to uh, uh, contribute to this. So that's the way that works. Let me go ahead and power this guy down. And uh, any questions on it, guys? No questions. All right. No questions. Exactly. Cool. I think it's uh, awesome. It'll be good to see what uh, results you get. Uh, I'm just, yeah, thinking of ideas in my head of ways that we can use this to test. I guess, um, so has you know remember the video i did on the accelerometer on your iphone yes so in, in those particular tests nothing was showing but in this fiber optic gyro it's showing the 15 degrees correct right has anyone it, actually done a test with the with the iphone uh well we we have the same type of accelerometers in the androids and no they don't right. show any drift but then again they're working off of different principles the right the accelerometers are inertial based okay the the fiber optic gyro is interferometry based okay, okay gotcha. and so they they really work in very very different ways um but the accelerometer make no mistake uh, is very useful um you know i think you guys remember uh, gosh who who was it did the test a long time ago i forgot his channel name but me too uh, uh redrick redick uh, redick ranick ranick that's what it was ranick yeah. Rannick did it and uh, he was showing uh, you, you basically trying to say that, you know, these accelerometers um, are would show a curvature change. Now, there has been some I'm not going to say that that's 100 percent correct at this point, because we have gotten some conflicting information about whether or not that is actually true. So uh, I'm going to, you know, reserve comment on that uh, about that you know, particular thing. But what we do know is we're absolutely sure about how this fiber optic gyro works. And we're actually very sure about how the, the, uh, uh accelerometers is that, work. Is that made by Honeywell? Um, no, this is made by a company called KVH. Uh, Honey, okay. Honeywell actually makes the ring laser gyro and the fiber optic gyro is actually more accurate. And this is the interesting thing because the ring laser gyro, uh, fires a laser beam around in free space. Okay. Um, and the, the, the fiber optic gyro is launching uh, the light around inside of a fiber optic connector that's coiled up several times. So it gives us a lot higher resolution and much better sensitivity than the um, uh, ring laser gyroscope. Okay. So anyway, there it has, you can see, like I said, you can see the drift figures here. And it's interesting because these drift figures definitely change uh, you know, in contrast to Rick's location, his latitude. Um, so, uh, you know, we can ultimately kind of put together an etheric flow map if we get this in several different places, you know, around an area. We can start to extrapolate then the flow of the ether, if you will. So, and for me, the best gyroscope uh, is to steal the water for me. The, the best gyroscope is, the, is still the water? Is, the water, yeah. I mean, if you put water in the bottle and you start moving the water, the what the the bottle, the water is gonna, you know, remain <laughs> in the same position as you fill the bottle. So, it's uh, when you see the, the the that kind of movement and you see the horizon, it's the water. It's like it's like have water inside a container and you move the container and the water remain remain remains, uh, re, re, remains rigidity in space. Right. You know, yep. well, there you have and it. then you have and then you have the human eyes and then you have this kind of equipment, you know, just toys, expensive yeah. toys, toys, toy, expensive toys in terms in comparison with nature, you know, 
Yep. And I, I one thing, one other thing I will say is for you know the people that don't like this, um, you know, demonstration is that you know a, a lot of the criticism that has come forward is like, well, you guys should have set it up right next to a standard gyroscope and showed that there was no precession in the standard gyroscope. And I can assure you that has been done. I don't I don't believe it has been uh, videoed side by side. However, that is something I'm more than willing to do because I have a very nice gyroscope, a mechanical gyro. It's one of those $300 uh, expensive ones, mechanical ones that run for a half an hour. And uh, I will be more than happy to set them up side by side where you can see that the mechanical gyro has no drift. And the reason the mechanical gyro has no drift is because there is no actual motion. There is no rotation. Um, again, the reason the fiber optic gyro picks it up is because it is picking up the the ether, right, that is rotating or the stars above us. And, you know, like I said, if, if Aries failure wasn't enough to prove what was rotating and what wasn't, um, the experiments that we're doing and also the documentation that we have brought forth from uh, several high level academic uh, uh, institutions uh, absolutely will do that. So anyway. Um, it's kind of cool, but yeah, this uh, this video is definitely worth looking at, and it also goes back into the Malcolm Bowden's explanation about how that all works. Um, it's a rehash of everything we've done, but believe it or not, guys, and I know it may sound boring to keep going over it and over and over it again, but I have to tell you, <laughs> even in FE Core, and even with Rick, Rick told me, you know, he goes, oh my God, Bob, I just got it. I just figured it out, what you've been saying all this time, and goes, honestly, I thought you were either... Uh, completely wrong or, or lying about it. And then it kind of hit him what I was saying about the linear velocity versus the angular uh, velocity. And at that point, um, you know, it went through FE core like, um, you know, a hot knife through butter. Everybody figured it out. And now everybody is on the same page and we have been pursuing this ever since. So, you know, if, if it gets boring with me talking about it over and over and over again. It's only because I'm trying to get it to register in people's heads what's actually going on here. It's actually fairly simple. It really is. But you have to have your head in the right place. And eventually at some point, I'm pretty sure with some of these uh, demonstrations and experiments that we're going to be doing, um, that's going to click in for a lot of people. So there ye have it. And one last time, just so I make sure I have the right one, it's the DSP-1760 we're talking about? That is correct. Thank you, sir. All right. You're very welcome. And I have just powered down the fiber optic gyro. And yeah, I'm, I'm nervous handling this thing because it's so freaking expensive. But uh, rest assured, Rick, I am taking very, very, very good care of it. <laughs> I, I jump on it and make sure it's registering correctly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Talk about having All my, right, don't do that. Don't my do kid that. gloves on. <laughs> Drop it down the stairs and see if it registers every step correctly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right, cool. So, all right, what else did I have? Um, oh, yes, geez, how could I forget about this? This this is beautiful, guys. This is a an article uh, that was just written on April 30th, so, you know, five days ago, uh, by Sci and it's published in Scientific American, and it is titled... Okay. Cosmology has some big problems, as if we didn't know that, oh, right? Man. We're <laughs> off by a factor of 10 to the 120th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a slightly large problem. Yep. So I want to jump into reading uh, parts of this because this is, I mean, I couldn't have written it, written it better myself. It is so good. So let's start reading this about, okay. So it says, what do we really know about our universe? Born out of a cosmic explosion 13.8 billion years ago, the universe rapidly inflated and then cooled. It is still expanding at an increasing rate and mostly made up of unknown dark matter and dark energy, right? I don't think so, Tim. <laughs> this well-known story is usually taken as, self, as a self-evident scientific fact, despite the relative lack of empirical evidence and despite a steady crop of discrepancies arising with observations of the distant universe. In recent months, new measurements of the Hubble constant or the rate of universal expansion suggested major differences between two independent methods of calculation. Discrepancies on the expansion rate have huge implications, not simply for calculation, but for the validity of cosmology's current standard model at the extreme scales of 
the cosmos, you know, the one that's off by a factor of 10 to the 120th. Right. And, 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 and by the way, guys, uh, I, I don't know if you guys uh, remember this, but of course, my explanation as to why modern cosmology is off by a factor of 10 to the 120th is because that would be about the approximately correct scale, in my opinion, uh, scaling difference between our actual little enclosed world here, right? That, that you know, has a 60,000 mile perimeter around it, theoretically. You're probably right. You're probably right. It's exactly the same factor. Exactly. Hey, Bob, yes. Uh, drop that uh, link in the description. I have to do a video on this. So just, I mean, in the um, chat for me. Thank you. The, the, the Scientific American one? Yeah. Okay. Coming Thank at you. you. Appreciate it. Okay. Now continue. Okay, cool. <laughs> so anyway, as I was saying, the, the scale difference is compared to that of our little uh, terrarium here, if you will, uh, as compared to the outrageous uh, numbers that mainstream cosmology would have us believe of things being billions of light years and millions of light years across. You know, when you look at it and look at it that way and think that, well, things really aren't much further than a mm, couple hundred, 500, maybe a thousand miles, whatever, um, and you compare that to hundreds of light years, thousands of light years, millions and billions of light years, that, ladies and gentlemen, is where your error factor of 10 to the 120th power is coming from, in my humble opinion. Okay? So anyway, so let's continue on. Uh, another recent probe found galaxies inconsistent with the theory of dark matter, which posits this hypothetical substance to be everywhere. But according to the latest measurements, it is not, suggesting the theory needs to be re-examined. Well, I think we've definitely covered that, haven't we, about the dark matter and how nonsensical it actually is. But uh, it's good to know that at least mainstream is starting to catch on to this. So let's continue on. It's perhaps worth stopping to ask why astrophysicists hypothesize dark matter to be everywhere in the universe. The answer lies in a peculiar feature of cosmological physics that is not often remarked. For a crucial function of theories such as dark matter, dark energy, and inflation, which each, with, which each in its own way is tied to the Big Bang paradigm, is not to describe known empirical phenomena, but rather to maintain the mathematical coherence of the framework itself while accounting for discrepant observations. So in other words, guys, they're saying that, you know, just like Walt Thornhill said a long time ago, the object is, is to make the math work out, right? Damn the actual results, just fit it into the math envelope. That's all that matters. Did I write this article? Yeah, you know, right? <laughs> I might have wrote this in my sleep and just forgot I wrote it. I, I know. The Scientific that, American published my work, but thank you. Uh, it's exactly what I thought, too. It's like, wow, I couldn't have done any better. <laughs> um, so anyway, okay, so fundamentally, they are names for something that must exist insofar as the framework is assumed to be universally valid, and assumed being the big keyword there. Each new discrepancy between observation and theory can, of course, in and of itself be considered an exciting promise of more research, a progressive refinement towards the truth. But when it adds up, it could also suggest a more confounding problem that is not resolved by tweaking parameters or adding new variables. Uh-oh, mass right. running out. <laughs> yeah, when you start with an incorrect foundation, then you, know, you may tell people that you're getting closer and closer to the truth, but you're just getting further and further away, truly. Yeah, exactly right. Or it comes down to the old saying in computer programmers world, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> All right. Consider the context of the problem and its history. As a mathematically driven science, cosmological physics is usually thought to be extremely precise. Yeah, right. Uh, but the cosmos is, un is unlike any scientific subject matter on Earth. A theory of the entire universe based on our own tiny neighborhood as the only known sample of it requires a lot of simplifying assumptions. And boy, that's exactly what they do. That's why cosmology, astronomy, astrophysics are all pseudosciences because it is nothing but Assumption after assumption compounded by mathematical formula and mathematical theory, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Anyway, when these assumptions are multiplied and stretched across vast distances, the potential for error increases. And this is further compounded by our very limited means of testing. 
Yeah, limited it would be an understatement. Uh, historically, it's Newton's- a fact. They know everything, Bob. They sent out the Challenger and the, all the Explorer satellites to the outer stretches of the universe. They know it all. Just That's reminding. right. And they can send back signals that are one ten trillionth of a billionth of a picowatt. <laughs> no, no, those are those are reflections, so they don't they don't have to go by the inverse square law. Oh, that's right. God, oh, yeah. Hat tip to Simon Dan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, where was I? Okay, Einstein's general relativity framework provided an extended and more precise reach beyond the furthest reaches of our own galaxy. But just how far could it go? The Big Bang paradigm that emerged in the mid 20th century effectively stretches the model's validity to a kind of infinity, <laughs> defined either as the boundary of the radius of the universe, calculated at 46 billion light years, um, or in terms of the beginning of time. Uh, this giant stretch is based on a few concrete discoveries, such as Edwin Hubble's observation that the universe appears to be expanding in 1929 and the detection of the microwave background radiation in 1964. But considering <laughs> I this, it says, I, love, I just have to stop for a second. It says uh, this giant stretch is based on a few concrete discoveries, such as Edwin <laughs> Hubble's observation that the universe appears to be expanding. <laughs> yeah, that's so really concrete. concrete concrete discovery because something appears to be doing something. That's funny. All right, go ahead. Sorry, I won't interrupt anymore. <laughs> That's okay. Love the commentary. Uh, da, 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 where was I? Uh, okay. But considering the scale involved, these limited observations have had an outsized influence on cosmological theory. Boy, that's an understatement. <laughs> Um, it is, of course, entirely plausible that the validity of general relativity breaks down much closer to our own home than at the edge of the hypothetical end of the universe. And if that were the case, today's multi-layered theoretical edifice of the Big Bang paradigm would turn, turn out to be a confusing mix of fictional beasts invented to uphold the model <laughs> along with empirically valid variables, mutually reliant on each other to the point of making it impossible to sort science from fiction. Jeez. I keep having to check the URL to make sure we're not at the onion. That <laughs> sounds know. like an onion article. <laughs> it really does. Doesn't sound like something from Scientific American, but they're dead they're dead on. They're, they are. They're nuts on. They are telling it like it is, guys. This is some serious scientific American word salad here for you uh, NASA fanboys. All right, so compounding this problem, most observations of the universe occur experimentally and indirectly. No kidding. Today's space telescopes provide no direct view of anything. They produce measurements through an interplay of theoretical predictions and pliable parameters in which the model is involved every step of the way. The framework literally frames the problem. It determines where and how to observe. And so, despite the advanced technology and methods involved, the profound limitations to the endeavor also increase the risk of being led astray by the kind of assumptions that cannot be calculated. Oh, my God. I uh, mean, this is a great find. <laughs> it really is. Uh, okay, so after spending many years researching the foundations of cosmological physics from a philosophy of science perspective, I have not been surprised to hear some scientists openly talking about a crisis in cosmology, kind of like the one Michio Kaku was talking about. Right. In Watch the movie The Principle for more information on that. Exactly. Great movie. Um, except it's not round. It's flat. Anyway. <laughs> in the They'll big get there eventually, I think, one day. I think so. I think I think Sun Genesis is so close. No, and, and that is why it's a movie. Right. Yeah, well, there is that. But it's a hell of a lot more of a documentary than Behind the Curve ever was, that's for sure. So, okay, in the big inflation debate in Scientific American a few years ago, a key piece of the Big Bang paradigm was criticized by one of the theory's original proponents for having become indefensible as a scientific theory. Why? Because inflation theory relies on ad hoc contrivances to accommodate almost any data. And because it is proposed physical its proposed physical field is not based on anything with empirical justification. This is probably because a crucial function of inflation is to bridge the transition from an unknowable Big Bang to physics we can recognize today. So it is science. Right. So is it science or a convenient invention? Right. You have to have inflation so that you can rewind to the beginning of time. If you don't have that, then you can't rewind. And we've already discussed about Hubble 
Uh, I've said it a million times, that that quote about having to stay away from the absolute horror of being in a unique position. That's the reason they had to adopt the idea of expansion, and that's the idea. That's the reason why everything, he just said it, everything has to run ex- directly through it. Uh, no matter what observation you make, it has to match the expansion theory, because otherwise uh, we're the center of the universe and everything is um, you know, central to us. Crazy. I, I love this article. Continue. Yep. That's great. Okay. And I, you got to love this. Uh, a few astrophysicists, such as Michael J. Disney, hmm, <laughs> whether or not he's any relation to the, you know, the infamous Disney's or not, I just thought that was ironic, um, have criticized the Big Bang paradigm for its lack of demonstrated certainties. In his analysis, the theoretical framework has far fewer certain observations than free parameters to tweak them a so-called negative significance that would be alarming an alarming sign for any science. No kidding. But not, not pseudoscience. That's the problem. No, it fits it's right into pseudoscience. Fits right in. Keep it coming. <laughs> yep. As Disney writes in American Scientist, a skeptic is entitled to feel that a negative significance after so much time, effort, and trimming is nothing more than one would expect of a folktale constantly re-edited and fit and to fit inconvenient new observations. Uh, let's see. And I think that's more. Let me see if there's any more. Da, 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 da. Anyway, he goes on talking about how this is Great. ultimately a mathematical construct. I'll, I'll definitely obviously lead it in the link. This article is fabulous. Um, I can't take the time to rest, read the rest of it, but it's fabulous. And again, this goes back to remember. Remember, it was I'll last week. I'll definitely do a video just reading that whole thing and then also inputting some of my own opinions and then also some quotes from scientists because all that is, yeah, that's great. He, he summarized the whole problem in an article. Yeah, it's nuts on yeah, and Yeah, Simon Dan will tell you it's all fact and, and anybody who questions uh, something so obviously contrived is an idiot. So, I mean, it's just because they want to believe in that theory. It allows them to be atheists. It allows them to believe that their actions here they'll never be responsible for. It allows them to lie whenever they want uh, because there's no, who cares? If there's, you know, if there's no reason for you not to lie if there's no, um, you know, morality built inside of us. But uh, there is. There is a morality built inside you. It was put there from the very beginning. And, uh, yeah, there's some people out there who will do anything. And by anything, I mean uh, expound upon their theories like this says uh, to the point of being off by 10 to the 120th, which should not be allowed in any walk of life, let alone in something that's going to try and call itself scientific. And, and this is what they've done. Now, to this point, uh, the whole world believes in this, in these ideas that they've passed off as truth and, and backed by the word science with a capital S. And uh, there's nothing further from the truth than, than their contrived uh, theory and everything that's based. And again, like he said, that the model is involved in every, in every bit of it. And, and no matter what you observe, you have to pull it into the model and then people want to say oh well, this is proof of that model well you're operating within the framework of the model so you can't that's not proof of anything yet these guys will will say that it's all proven crazy i, I love this article yeah it's great and you know it, well and let me let me read this last line too it, it, this is so uh you know hypothetical and they admit that you know that it's it's basically a complete theory and remember we covered the definition of a theory last week and and really when you're talking about scientific theory it's something that has been validated and tested uh you know quite often that that there's a lot of evidence that support this right and so the big bang theory is considered a scientific theory which of course by its own definition means that it's been fairly well validated right but then it says from the outset, the theory only spoke to the immediate aftermath of an explicitly hypothetical event. Wow, no kidding. Whose principal function was as a limit condition, the point at which the theory breaks down. The Big Big Bang Theory says nothing about the Big Bang. It is rather a possible hypothetical premise for resolving general relativity. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And remember, guys, when we when we say they're extrapolating and guessing and and calculating and formulating uh, all of this stuff, remember as to how they put that that picture together of the Big Bang. Right? They essentially took a few pixels, um, you know, hypothetically speaking, even though it was through uh, radio telescopes, and so they took a gigapixel image that they were trying to image. They took about eight pixels of it and they extrapolated 
so heavily it was beyond belief and the conditions that they extrapolated on were on earth-based objects that would fit into what they think the object or the phenomenon of the black hole would look like. No basis in reality whatsoever. As far as physical data, almost none whatsoever. Like I said, maybe eight pixels out of a megapixel or a gigapixel, and they are extrapolating that picture out from that and saying, look what we did. Aren't you proud of us? It's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> so anyway, that uh, written by uh, Bjorn Ekberg, PhD, philosopher of science and author of Metaphysical Experiments, published by the University of Minnesota Press. So, you know, he's no schmuck. He's a PhD um, and he is spot on. I, in fact, I'm amazed that Scientific uh, American allowed this to be uh, published. In fact, I've already converted it to PDF because I, I can't believe it's still there. But whatever. You know, maybe they have some other plan uh, coming out and how they're going to reveal the the folly of of their model. Right. It's hard to say. But that is about all I have, guys, that I came with today. And uh, you guys have anything that you want to talk about or should we think about wrapping this up? I remember that all the measurements that they publish in the articles are based in, uh, you know, in two main assumptions. The first is the astronomical unit which uh, nobody you know have the possibility to really corroborate which is the distance between the earth and the sun based on the transit of the moon earth of venus uh in uh this uh, seventh uh, 18th century by a yeah, huh? Hero, the, the au is one <laughs> yeah they normalize <laughs> the measurement they normalize from that it's one so uh, it's one right. period but right. that is the, we could the, say the, the distance between me and Eru is a a Eru. It's a one. Exactly. So right. and then to calculate because they did it by a parallax measurement between the Earth and the transit of Venus, assuming that Venus has the same size of the Earth, and assuming that the Earth is a, a spherical. So they are creating all these, and that 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 was made by the Cheswit order. So. Uh, they are the guys who establish the uh, measurement of the universe, like uh, the Grace Tyson said in, the, in one interview. Uh, so that is the first thing, you know, you have all this trouble because you are assuming so many things to establish the one unit uh, relationship with the rest of the universe that that is the first uh, problem, you know. So starting from that point, uh, you are going to have everything, you know, of the, the real or not the real, who knows, the real distances. That is why, for me, the, uh, the, the old uh, ancient civilization, they use, uh, like, uh, angles in the sky, you know? Angels, angles in the sky, because you don't need to really know the distances, because you know how operate with the energy of the sun and the moon and the stars uh, for seasons, you know, for, you know, make the food gr uh, grow and, uh, you know, when you need to collect the food, where it's going to come in again, the same kind of weather to use it. Uh, so why you need to know the distances? You're never going to reach them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, because they got to make their math. You know, they got to make their mathematical fairy tale and tell people that it's a fact so that they can get billions in financing to do nothing but lie. So, Completely. you know, we all know the answer why, but... Uh, you know, hopefully the rest of the world and the rest of the world is waking up. I got to say this. Um, I'm amazed at how well this is actually carrying off. And, you know, one of the things that that tell me um, how well we're actually doing is we are over the target to such a degree that the flack coming in is outrageous. And <laughs> I can tell you that. I mean, literally, when I'm when I'm either myself or Cami or uh, any of our channel mods are deleting three, four, five hundred comments a day that are nothing more than uh, you guys suck, you, you're retards and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. It, it just tells you that we're right over the mark and they have nothing. They no longer even have an argument to present. It's all down to ad hom attacks and that's all they've got. And to me, that just warms my heart to the max um, because then you see other idiots like Simon Dan coming out and making stupid statements like, oh, well, inverse square law doesn't work on reflections. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, these people are utterly clueless. 
Um, you'd think if they were going to hire decent trolls, they would hire people with a good science background. But I think the reason that they don't do that is they would quickly see the problems and they would not necessarily be so um, inclined to be brainwashed. And I could be wrong because obviously a lot of people are brainwashed about it. But I think that, you know, those who really are tasked with debunking things, kind of like what, uh, you remember Mark Sargent's challenge to the physicists that, uh, that he had. And then when the <laughs> physicists took a look at it, he's like, forget it. I'm out. I'm not even going to try and answer any of these. They can't. And they don't want to be made a mockery of to, to, you know, people to criticize them because they can't answer the question of a stupid flat earther. Right. So they're, they're lost. We're winning. Yeah. And that's why the best is. defense is to simply, you know, throw out those uh, ad hom attacks. So they'll continue to do that. Yep. Absolutely true. So, yeah. But no, I've got nothing else to answer your question. Okay, cool. Well, I, I guess John didn't make it. I guess he was still working, but. Uh... Oh, shit. I forgot to tell you. Sorry, he won't be here. <laughs> 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 he already told me that. No, okay. I forgot. I was, I was going to put in the chat, but I, I just forgot. Sorry. Ah, uh, right. John has to work late, so he won't be here. And he says that, uh, I don't know, something happened with his car or something. I don't know. He'll yeah. be here next week. Okay, cool. And yeah, next week, uh, we theoretically, we should all be here. And then the week after that, I think you, John, and Iru uh, will be doing it. And I will be at the experiment, the force the level experiment. So that'll be cool. Yeah, that will be really cool. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, so I guess that's all we have for today. So, Iru, I will uh, let you wrap up and let anybody know what you're doing this week, and uh, then we'll go from there. So what's uh, what's going on down in Argentina? Well, yesterday we have the, I believe was it, it was the third um, uh, anti-flatter convention in official institution, which is the planetary here in my city because they are so worried, you know, like uh, this movement is grow up so quickly that after the event that we did here in Argentina a few weeks ago, uh, you know, like I said in the last show, you know, the media was completely uh, blow away, you know, so they, they keep talking. In fact, they are so worried that the um, last president of uh, of Argentina, which is uh, which was a woman called Cristina Kirchner, uh, he released uh, she released a book, an official book, and in that book, she mentioned the flat earthers as a people that don't uh, believe in reality. So they trying to extrapolate <laughs> that in 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 economical and political world that we have some. Flat earther, you know, people that doesn't uh, grasp the reality of the facts. But that is how worried these people are. Because if you are putting, you know, we are talking about the president that put in orbit two satellite, of course. So <laughs> she knows, I believe she knows a little bit about these uh, businesses that you can, you know, afford with this heliocentric model. I don't know. Uh, if she knows, well, I believe she knows uh, that the earth is flat because this uh, president come from a Masonic family and, you know, the same thing as you guys have on the United States and the rest of the world has in, you know, in their uh, own countries. So, but, you know, for, for the flatter community here, we call really attention because, I mean, we must, uh, we, we are in the book at that level. You know, they must be trying to debunk us even in the political book, uh, you know, growth by uh, a president. It's really strange. And like I said at the beginning, uh, yesterday and in here in the observatory of my city, they uh, make, uh, uh, you know, just a conference talking the science versus pseudoscience. And of course, the pseudoscience was the uh, flat earth, uh, you know, community. So we are making good things because, like you said, Bob, uh, they are so worried that they, they can't stop uh, talk about us. So that for me is that we are, uh, I don't know if it's winning this, uh, you know, social or, or media world, but it's in that, uh, in that path. Yep, absolutely true. And you're right. They keep talking about us and keep talking about us because they can't ignore us. Um, because, you know, like I said, it's catching on to so many people that they're, they're in panic mode. They're in absolute panic yes. mode. 
Yes, um, and we are going to make, uh, I don't want to forget, uh, we're going to make in three weeks, um, we're going to make uh, an experiment uh, like the, you know, like you guys uh, have the equivalent with uh, Michigan Lake from Chicago. Uh, right. well, yeah, well, we have here, and I mentioned uh, uh, sometimes in other shows, uh, we have the from Buenos Aires to Uruguay, we have uh, 55 kilometers away, and you can see all the uh, city, you know, the skyline of uh, Buenos Aires from Uruguay. And we have, um, for, uh, fortunately, we have really, uh, you know, um, small buildings. So we that, that, that building must be out of the view completely, and we can clearly see more than half of those buildings. But... In this case, we're gonna have like um, like uh, experiments show. You know, we 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 contract a few people that make real professional videos. So we're gonna go there with uh, like um, like um, a lawyer to certificate all the observations, and we're gonna prepare that as you know as um, um, like Nat, Nat Geo documentary something like that, but uh, in our uh, favor. Uh, so we're going to be busy with that. So it's time, you know, I, I, I really um, like the idea that the, we, the Flat Earther, uh, we are making a lot of experiments to, you know, demonstrate our point of view, uh, something that the globalists never did or never do. All right. Yep. All right, beautiful. And uh, also, uh, Iru, we, Jaren and I were talking before uh, you got on here, but uh, sometime this week we need to kind of get together because Jaren wants to do a show on his channel um, where we can do an Electric Universe thing. Yes, yes, I know that, yeah. Beautiful, okay. And also, oh, uh, my wife tells me that I need to shout out the 24-7 Flat Earth Discord server, um, which I believe is in the show notes, but also we also have a 24-7 um, YouTube channel called uh, Globusters 24-7. Uh, you've probably seen the link for it uh, go by several times. I'll have it in the show notes, but uh, we've been running the 24-7 channel uh, for quite some time. And we actually have another server ready to run another 24-7 channel. Uh, we just need to get that loaded up and uh, um, online. So, and that one, that one, I think Jaren's going to populate. Uh, so it may be uh, all Jaren all the time. Right, Jaren? <laughs> Ooh. Who could, who, who could want anything more? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, cool. So, uh, all right, Jaren, so what do you have coming up this week besides the fabulous show with uh, Iru and Bob that you're going to do on uh, the Electric yeah, Universe? Yeah, that should be great. Electric Universe. And, uh, yeah, I want to read that Scientific American article again. Uh, also, I'm going to do another show with that Clint uh, Wayland, I think his last name is. We did a show before on history. We're going to be doing a show coming up again. Uh, hopefully this week or next week and uh, that's it just so thank everybody for watching thanks to all the mods everyone in the chat we do appreciate it a lot and thanks for the super chats and uh, again thank you everyone who was at the sacramento meetup yesterday um you know thank you for you know so much kindness and i don't know friendship there so just thanks a lot for that thank you Effie mishka for organizing that and saying i looked thin that was the highlight of my week uh but a close second was this show today so anyway yeah, keep an eye on my channel and what? Glad you're up. No, no, we have uh, Joshua Doily, which has like a, a, a frenesy of super chat. So thank you <laughs> to Joshua. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You never know when a video may pop up on my channel. So anyway. Uh, and then I always want to thank my patrons who, you know, help me do something that I love every day. So while searching the truth. So thanks a million to all them. You can join them if you want. Patreon.com slash Jaronism. And you can also donate to Iru over there. Uh, who also has a Patreon, and I believe John does too. So you can get uh, a lot of donations done over there if you wish. If not, then just keep watching this show, keep watching my channel, and we appreciate all the likes and shares and uh, subscribes and all that fun stuff. So uh, see you guys soon. All right, beautiful. Okay. And as for me, um, you know, pretty much same old, same old. Uh, like I said, FE Core did release some... Um, videos on the force the level experiment which will be taking place the 18th and 19th and potentially the 17th of may um so i will be here next week but then the week after that um it's going to be jaren john and iru uh, hosting the show and i'll be on site uh at the uh, uh test site which is off at about 96th and tower roughly in that area 
So anybody that comes out, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, we'll put you to work though. But uh, I also think that uh, um, somebody was going to was talking about providing lunch for everybody. Well, that's kind of cool too. But other than that, uh, not a whole lot more. Again, thank you guys uh, for all the super chats. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate them. Uh, we, we all do. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely put them to good use, but we very much appreciate them. It's great uh, having the monetization back. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we'll just keep plugging away on it. So we will see you guys next week. And until then be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind. There's truth inside. Peace out everybody. Peace.